Hello everyone, and welcome to episode number 63 of the Avocado Gamescast. Today we're talking about mashups and crossovers, both real ones and ones we might like to see. But before we get to that, let's introduce ourselves. I'm your host, Merv, and today I'm joined by... He's looking forward to the zombie DLC for Wilmot's Warehouse. It's Science is Bad! Hello! <laughs> I love that game. I wish for more DLC for him. Yes, please. Absolutely. Next up, for some reason, he won't take my suggestion to cover Arby's in the next installment of Franchise Festival. It's Singing Breakman. Hello, everybody. Arby's may have the meats, but it does not have the games. That mm. is true. Next, he won first place in a spooky poetry contest called Luigi's Scansion. It's Wolfman Jew. You know, I could put anything in a crossover with Luigi's Mansion. And not even a game, just in Luigi's Mansion. I look forward to it. And finally, after nearly four years, he successfully convinced his co-host to play Halo Reach. It's the Kappa. We did it. We did it, chat. We did yeah, it. we can finish the podcast right now. Yeah. yeah it's Wrap over. It up. No more podcasts. Uh, I was actually playing it last night with uh, some of my old college friends. Uh, that game's really fun to play co-op because you can just mess yeah. around. Now you, I, you want. It, it, that's kind of where, you know, like, I think all, all the Bungie games are best experienced with friends. The, you know, they call it the friend game instead of the end game. I really buy it with them, though. I mean, oh. it's just so silly to play some of those games and see, like, a grenade explode and flip the warthog and everybody shoots out, you know, across the map. And it, it's got everything you'll ever need for, for good times. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> turned on, like, the extra grenade uh, skull or perk, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, yeah, that made things pretty chaotic. Is Halo Reach in the uh, Master Chief collection or whatever it's called? It is. Uh, they, yes, yes. They, oh, they nice. Tossed it in as a bonus. I think actually everything's uh, up to four is in there now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think there's oh. four, five, and the RTSs is in there. Yeah, I thought yeah. they were all still like coming soon. Uh, not on PC. Oh, so they're not oh, there yeah, yet. Yeah. Yeah. They will be there eventually. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, I'm thinking from PCs, the PC perspective. On PCs, Halo Reach, and Halo 1. Yeah, yeah they're hey, porting a game something. at a time. Uh, like I think probably every six months you're going to see one. So if you buy yeah. the collection, you get them all. It's yeah. just uh, they're yeah. they're doing them as they're getting they're, them out uh, the door. Yeah, they're doing. Yeah, I gotta play some of those before I finally get around to writing an article on that series. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Reach is fun. Um, I think Reach is probably the the the, the culmination of so many different things that it, it just hits perfectly. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it, but if you're going to start with a Halo chronologically and you know kind of the experience wise i think that's a good one to do it with oh then i yeah then i screwed I, up I, <laughs> like, I did it wrong combat evolved past couple of days and i'm like oh man this is this feels like a step back um, it is I mean, it's a huge step back but i mean it is it is also a much older game um, yeah yeah that's the only one i've ever played reach, but oh yeah i, I, I played fun. it and i had a bad time i i did not like it well, I mean, you, that's that's a hard one to put in perspective, right? Like, it's, yeah, I understand that it's important it, and it it is a cult classic. But man, reaching those flood levels, yeah, oh my I, god! I think it, it was I, kind uh, of before too. They they really figured out how they like to tell stories, you know. Because yeah. Halo Two is when it really starts to be like, oh wow, okay, yeah, now I get all this stuff. But, um, but, but yeah. then after that, Halo Three felt like this very bizarre step back from Halo Two in terms of its storytelling. And, gameplay yeah but odst was the opposite i think like so you've got a, a big span there between those three games um, welcome to the halo podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I've been, did, I, we did a halo podcast like 30 yeah, episodes ago i've been i've been trying to get merv to play it forever so i feel i feel a little bit good now i guess i gotta play like some baba is you or something to return <laughs> <laughs> do it yo baba is you is actually like legit great though it's not <laughs> like a it, you have to be into puzzle games, though. If you're not like super into puzzle games, you'll just hate yourself. I, I oh, can love them. Yeah. Wow, Baba! I am into puzzle games, and Baba is you broke me over its knee. Oh, I I, I look at this game, and I'm I'm super into puzzle games. And I look at Baba is you, and I'm like, nope, no, thank you. Yeah, it destroyed me. Oh, yeah, no. I have math brain, so it just works <laughs> well on. <laughs> um, I do like Sudoku, and I do like Picross, but somehow I just I. Yeah, I know it's a different type of game, uh, but I'm saying I like puzzle games overall. I have the and weirdest like, you know. preferences because I hate Sudoku but love Picross. Same, oh, yeah. I'm right there with yeah. you. Yeah. Is it, oh, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is it Picross or is it Picross? 
<laughs> I have well, no idea. I have a colleague of Picross. I, I was saying Picross all my I, life. I say Picross too, but a buddy of mine calls it Picross. Okay, that's interesting. I mean, I guess you could also just call them nonograms, but yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's, that's like the, the that's like the unbranded term. It's like I calling just, it facial I just, tissue instead of cleaning. I just thought <laughs> it was from like picture across, like you know. So no, that yeah. makes more sense than whatever I was doing. Oh. I never thought of it like that. Picture yeah. across. Yeah. yeah, it's like GIF. It's not like GIF. <laughs> oh, Nothing's God. like GIF. Oh, now we're getting <laughs> into anyway, it. Anyway, what have you been Please, playing, folks? No. Uh, I've been playing a bunch of games. I've been, the last time I spoke, I, like I've been on the podcast, I've I've played like sixteen games from from. Oh boy, as you know, being stuck inside and you, you don't have uh, many options to entertain and yourself and like, yeah, I'm going to play this game that I've, I haven't played. I'm going to play Halo One. I'm gonna see how how that how that goes. Yeah. It goes bad for me. I don't like it. <laughs> it turns out I. Um, I mean, it was good for for some time, and it was got super boring. But anyway, I know people love that game. I'm not here to like, you know, have hot takes or anything. Um, but yeah, I've been I've completed Final Fantasy VII remake. Oh, uh, how did that go? Yeah, it, uh, I really really liked it. I really liked it. I, I I didn't expect myself to like it as much as I did, um, which is like the general consensus from what I what I've heard. Yeah. Um, it is, it does some things like it, the combat is, uh, amazing. I, I'm going to say that it's, um, I played a little bit of Final Fantasy 14. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Final I, Fantasy yeah, 14. I, yeah. I don't, I have no idea what number it is, but you know, the one and, the, uh, the one with the cute boys. Yeah. The one with the cute boys, the <laughs> one with the cute boys squad. Yeah. And, um, sorry, Wolfman. I was gonna say, is it is it the one with the car? Then it's fifteen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the one with the car. Uh, so it's it it's a huge step up from that, uh, and it feels kind of like that kind of combat that kind of began with uh, cri- uh, well, like a Crisis Core, which is also like a Final Fantasy VII spinoff um, on PSP. Uh, which is like you control your main character and you give you you can like attack with them, um, but you also get like commands and you can give commands to your fellow teammates and you can also switch to them and control them, and to give commands to uh, to your teammates and you to also have commands uh, you know to use commands yourself. You gotta wait for the ATB bar to fill up, and you fill it up by mashing on enemies with your sword or gun or fists or whatever. Um, and it's um, one of my buddies who, sorry, uh, was really yeah. into it. Mentioned that there uh, combat was that there were some difficulty spikes. Did you feel that too, or no, no, no? I I've, uh, I felt it was uh, very well balanced, but it is. Um, it it probably depends on how many side quests you do because the side quests oh, yeah. give you some amazing rewards. Really, it's it's crazy how uh, how these are completely side things and they give you like uh, ba- basically materia is the magic system of the game that you equip in your weapons. It's like gems in Diablo, but instead of like giving you small boosts, it gives you abilities um, and. It, you you receive some really strong unique materia from from side quests that you would not have been able to get otherwise that uh, really like do a lot for the game. Um, uh, there, there's a ton of ma- abilities when it comes to magic and also each weapon gives you a d- distinct ability for that weapon. And you also uh, uh, so each character feels distinct um, because. Uh, you know, they uh, like Barrett is, um, uh, a sh- you know, a, a ranged character. So he has all the uh, uh, he can take down uh, enemies that are far up or like flying. He literally um, has a gun for an arm. Right? Yeah, he has a gun arm. Yeah. Uh, if you're not familiar with Final Fantasy VII characters, 
by this point, <laughs> which uh, you you might not be, but uh, uh, let's be honest, it's been you know people like those characters and they've been like everywhere. But yeah, yeah there's I Barrett. didn't play the game until last year, and I still oh. knew all of the characters. Yeah, yeah, I I think they they have through osmosis. You're like, yeah, I I get who Cloud is. I, I am learned who they were by playing Kingdom Hearts. Which yeah, that's also yeah. You, you, it's this, probably yeah. not the right way to learn about these people. It's fine. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Like the story is. Um, it has some uh, difficult themes, and it I think in some ways it handles them pretty well, surprisingly uh, well. I, I I was skeptical because I was like, oh boy, they're going to screw this up, aren't they? But no, they, they, they treat it with like, oh yeah, you're terrorists, uh, and you do as much damage as much as you, you want to do good. Um, and and uh, a lot of people are suffering be- because of what you did. Um, and there's uh, there's this uh, love hate relationship that the people of the city that you live in Midgar have with your group, a terrorist group that's called Avalanche, and um, and it's it's the, pretty well done. Um, they they really did a lot with the characters also, like they gave them some depth. Um, obviously, the story is what it is. You know, it's. Uh, you can't like uh, do too much with it because it is following basically the Final Fantasy VII, um, you know, rails. But uh, but the characters have a lot of like personality now in dialogue that I personality in their dialogue that I have not found in Final Fantasy VII original, and I have played through that game like four times. Um, so yeah, I'll take, obviously take everything I, what I say with a, like a. You know, grain of salt because I'm I do like Final Fantasy VII and I am uh, you know I I have the you know I'm nostalgic for it, um, but but I was also uh, worried that it's just uh, that it's going to just not be very um, very much fun to play because I was worried that they will stick with the Final Fantasy. 15 combat which i did not especially like but yeah they 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 uh they really um they really came up with some like it's very snappy they came up with some good ideas for it uh, the combat's fun the the voice acting is really good uh the characters have been like yeah uh, they gave them a little bit more depth um the game looks beautiful uh, except for some textures that are absolute garbage and you can tell that, oh, yeah, that's how they, like, have a steady... That's how they FPS. fit it on the disc. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> and that, you can see how if it comes out on PC, it will be one of the most beautiful games ever. Because uh, as it is, the character models are are just incredible. I can say that just, like, absolutely stunning. And uh, there's very little difference between um, between uh, cutscene character models and like in-game character models, it's it's a very p- pre-game. I'm sure they're like porting it to PC right now. With, yeah, like, yeah, that's Final what Fantasy I'm waiting 15. for personally. Yeah, so, I think they said so, a yeah. year exclusivity. Yeah, probably. And yeah, so I would recommend it. I would say that they. Uh, hmm, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it it is it uh, does some things. It's not strictly a Final Fantasy VII remake. The do take some chances. Some people don't like that they took some chances and took some liberties with the story, but uh, I liked it in concept maybe a little more than in execution a little bit at, at the end at the very least, but uh, I, I do very much enjoy it, and I, I do appreciate when people take risks with like remakes and retellings because I've already played this story, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I appreciate that they are trying to do some new things with it. I liked it. Good. It's a good yeah. game. Glad it's a good it. game. Um, so, Wolfman, what have you been playing? Well, actually, first I was, had a question that I wanted to ask Science about uh, Final Fantasy VII. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, sure. Uh, uh, just, so, just because I'm one of those people who, you know, knew all the characters and with and a bunch of the story, bef- like, without ever really having played the game outside of playing it for a couple hours um, last year, and I kind of fell off once I left Midgar because the rest of the area just felt really unsatisfying. Um, yeah. Uh, given the stuff 
about it that isn't a remake and the stuff the new stuff it attempts to do with its storytelling would you say that it is still kind of approachable for um players who aren't like intimately familiar with all of the different characters and all of the story elements 100 percent. okay cool. there, there's um, just a little tiny uh, bit at the end that's like kind of wink and nod to Long-time Final Fantasy VII fans, but I don't think it any of it will only uh, alienate anyone that's never played the Final Fantasy VII game. Okay, cool. Because basically, a lot of my decision for for purchasing video games is now that I'm in quarantine with the family. It's what would my dad want to want to watch. Oh, it's it, um, also I would say it's extremely corny and fun to watch. I think like a lot of our c- cutscenes are like goofy and kind of fun. I, I I think that someone would enjoy watching it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So I've been like you. I, I've been playing a ton of different things. A little bit of Death Stranding, a little bit of Outer Wilds, some bad Sonic stuff, Fire Emblem Warriors. But um, the one that I re- want to talk about is one that I don't know has ever been like a seriously covered on the games cast and that would be professor layton specifically cool. pr- the uh, professor layton and the osron legacy the sixth mm-hmm. game in the main the sixth mainline game in the series and the uh final episode of the prequel trilogy which is the um four five and six that come be- that basically exist before the original games um uh for those of you who haven't played or aren't familiar with professor layton and um it, it's sort of like, I, I guess the best way I could describe it is, you know how in Pokemon, like, all of the people in, po- in the world of Pokemon are just super, super into Pokemon, and that's all they talk about, or how, like, the people of Golf Story, all they talk about is golf? <laughs> um, yes. Professor um, Professor Layton is like that, but with puzzles. Um, it's It was inspired by... Um, by this one um, Japanese author who wrote like puzzle books as a way of like trying to kind of keep the mind agile and also the commercial success of the Ace Attorney series. So it's about a, an English professor gentleman named Layton and his like young preteen sidekick Luke who travel across the British countryside, like finding adventures because they always go after mysteries. And the whole idea in each of these series is twofold. One is that everything you do in the series is buttressed by solving dozens and dozens and dozens of puzzles, at least 120 in each game, usually up to 150, and which are things like math puzzles to, like, tricks to, like, wordplay to how to escort X numbers of animals across a bridge without... <laughs> oh, yeah, I love those. Other. How many matchsticks? Yes, how many matchsticks? Um, yeah. Yeah, can you find... Um, stuff like... You know, you're only given, like, the ability to move, like, an object one space at a time and have to, like, move and have to get everything the exact way. Slimy um, puzzles. Yes, yeah, sli- there's a lot of sliding puzzles. Um, yeah. and So that's half of it. The other half is, um, and this first half is something that Osron Legacy is doing very well, um, as it should by this point in the, its existence. Um, the other half, though, is a little bit more different. See, the log- see, Layton runs on a very weird set of logic and a very weird set of drama. Because in the Layton games, with the exception of the very first one, which didn't quite like do all of this, but does almost all of it, the idea is basically always the same, which is that Layton will come to a town or a community or some kind of air environment that's suffering some kind of horrible, mysterious, fantastical, like supernatural problem. There's a vampire or there's time travel. And it turns out that in the future, Leighton becomes a crime Lord, or um, there's a monster that's stalking a town and destroying all of its buildings. Or there's a evil like magician who's turning people into stone, stuff like that. Um, the, the movie for instance um, has that, but um. And so what ends up happening is that to solve the the case, late, we go on a bunch of adventures, and the, what you end up finding is that the answer to each puzzle, like each supernatural puzzle, is a human is a theoretically human answer that's somehow even more absurd and implausible than <laughs> if it was actually supernatural. Um, yeah, love it. It's sort of like, so it's like I guess Scooby Doo. Actually, yeah. I was it's even that, more um, more ridiculous. I think. Yeah, they really swing for the fences in their last yeah. act. 
Um, so actually, I think a better explanation for you, Merv, or a better comparison point would be, imagine if Persona 5 ended where, like, the Phantom Thieves, like, have uh, Shido tied up in front of the police station, and then Joker reveals that all of the Personas are actually, like, community theater troupe actors that Igor paid off. Because Igor had a lovely daughter named Futaba who was then lost to him, so he decided to then train all of these actors to turn into, like, weird, like, Jungian sex demons so that he could try to slowly have Joker get revenge on Shido. Wait, yeah, that's not like what that. happened in the game? Yeah, that's a really brilliant comparison <laughs> I, that, that, there. <laughs> I, I'm playing Royale, and that's exactly what, what the additional uh, game is like. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> the curtain like, oh, reveals. We're going to um, explain everything now. Okay. Yeah, it... It's it's kind of awesome, and but the but all of this like silliness is also complemented by the fact that um, the these are legitimately very dramatic games, and all of the monsters and the supernatural stuff and the explanations are always all tied to this fundamental like drama. It's almost always family drama, so it's usually like a person, like an older male figure, will have lost like their romantic partner or a member of their family or they're dying or they're kind of losing connection. So they do this as a way to kind of like close themselves off or to try to force that connection to exist again. And so it's, it is a very weirdly dramatic series that kind of belies the, like the kind of the warm 1970s meant to appeal to a European market anime well, dang, you're right. It's very often an older gentleman that somehow does crazy shit because he's lonely or whatever. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, yeah, and there's an elegance um, with the look to it um, where, yeah. where that really ties into that that very kind of cozy 1970s European feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it really does feel like it's something that could have let could have been on world masterpiece theater if it was <laughs> had been a book aimed at young girls that w was written before world war ii um yeah it so is like, very but, like fantasy europe ish what sorry it's so like enid enid blighton ish kind of almost don't know why I... I, yeah i'm unfamiliar with the reference i'm sorry okay never mind sorry she's an <laughs> english author Okay. Wrote kids books that were like, it it looks kind of books. like like you, what like, Japanese Europe it always like the term I like because it's like very like fantastically pictured Europe with like a lot more oh like uh, the Kiki's delivery service yeah kind of yeah 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 exactly, exactly. yes one hundred percent yeah which yeah. is like what if Germany was on the Mediterranean coast. That's right. Yeah, and, and <laughs> super exaggerated with like giant clock towers and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. so um I've been re um I've been kind of slow since um about late September I've been slowly going through the entire series. I stopped for a couple months because Pokémon came out and I suddenly decided that nothing was as important as me dominating the Galar region. But um I'm back with this one and I um played the first so the first five mainline games um i played at least once i played the first th four th the first four games multiple times i only played the um the set the um the fifth game once and right before i played this i played the cross the ace attorney crossover uh professor layton versus phoenix right ace attorney um and that game had a lot of really cool ideas that um i'm not going to get into now but um and it had a lot of nice like quality of life assurances that are all gone in Azeran Legacy, but it's in a bunch of ways it feels like a step back, not just from the crossover, but from kind of the series as a whole. Um, the main and I, sorry, I I did love that crossover with Phoenix Wright. Oh, it's such uh, such a good game. It feels like it shouldn't work, but I guess yeah, it but does. it one hundred percent did. Well, I was gonna talk about it as well, but I wanted okay. to. That's sorry. gonna be one of my. Oh no, no, it's fine. I, that's I'll be I'll be drawing from it a bit for today's discussion. <laughs> Um, sure. but, uh, yeah, and it is excellent though. Um, but, um, the thing is that in the prequel trilogy, as well as the movie, uh, the professor Layton and the eternal diva, which came out a month after the fourth game, um, the, the prequel trilogy, the sort of larger macro story is about not, not just these puzzles that Layton is solving, but that these puzzles involve these ancient like ruins from a million year old civilization, that existed in the deserts of England. 
Of course, obviously. Um, there the the English fifth game desert. takes place in this like. Okay. The fifth game has this kind of weird neo noir story where you're in this like town that was meant as like a resort town that was built. That was sort of like an astroturfed oasis in the middle of a desert, and it turns out that the desert, this British desert, is was home to this ancient super society. Um, so yeah. the sixth game um, isn't all deserts are some, some kind of a home to old super societies. Yeah, yeah, yeah that I mean, was where uh, where super societies were uh, preferred to live was deserts. Yeah, it's a historical yeah. fact. Uh huh. Yep. Moving on. The... <laughs> it starts oh, yeah. biblical. <laughs> um. So the ba- so um, so the main premise is that there was a girl who's been locked in ice for a million years because she's part of oh, this yeah. ancient civilization, the Azron, and Leighton, and uh, Leighton, his sidekicks, Luke and uh, Emmy. She's a prequel character. He's sort of like the Cato to Leighton's Green Hornet. Um, sure. It, um, they are kind of they go off because um, the prequel, vi- the villain for most of the prequel trilogy is in evil uh, sky pirate named Jean Descalais who dresses oh. like a bird man and wears a giant mask and oh, love kidnaps that. children and oh, tries no, no. to... <laughs> <laughs> this took a turn. And, <laughs> I don't like it um, And tries to use giant robots to basically steal people's youth and... Um, except, no, except... Um, Except that at the the post credit sequence of the fifth game, also these games have post credit sequences. Um, uh, so it's it, like it the MCU, out, okay? Yeah, it turns out there's an even bigger villain, which is an which is a paramilitary terrorist organization who's trying to take over all these sites. So now, Layton I thought is, these are like supposed to be sedate puzzle games. Oh like, no, God like, no! Uh, okay. Those are freaking. These games are crazy, Merv. Okay. Uh, the the. The third game. There's definitely game. a tension between their mechanics and their uh, their story, and that yeah. their mechanics are very buttoned down, but their story is quite the opposite. Fuck wild. Yeah. Um. Very famously, the third game has a sequence in which Leighton, Luke, and Luke from Ten Years in the Future are trapped in a casino staffed with mobsters who are trying to shoot them down with Tommy guns. So to get them back, Leighton builds a machine gun out of a slot machine that shoots coins. <laughs> Um, right. Yeah, but how, how but, do you do? So, anything else you'd like to tell us about uh, the latent game you're currently playing? Yeah, that's why I was. I'm sorry. I know it, it was a. This has been a long-winded one, but basically, <laughs> the, the the problem is that essentially in the in the in the main parts of the series, the idea is you have a single community and one main overarching question, of which there's like a bunch of weird little side questions that all turn out to be interconnected and because of that all the characters you get to spend time with them so they go from being these like weird british caricatures to basically the same but a little more warm a little more nice to spend time with and this one puzzle is given like a very singular explanation um this one though doesn't because since the premise is that leighton and his new professor partner who is totally the main villain from the prequels and i don't know how he doesn't know he's obviously the main villain from the prequels is are flying around in an airship across the world to what are basically micro communities solving micro puzzles. So instead of having like one community where everyone interacts, you're instead basically dealing with very minor stories that are, aren't very interesting with characters who don't get time to be developed. And so a story in which a chieftain of a jungle uh, village who is sad because no one knows he needs glasses is given equal weight to an airsats Dutch community where women are regularly sacrificed to appease a wind god. <laughs> oh, boy. There is, uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, you just, yeah, that's, uh, hmm. well, uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Wolfman, I'm happy you brought up that, that peculiarity with the, um, the, where some some Professor Layton games, and I'd say it's not just Azran Legacy, but um, a handful of the Layton games pull that kind of trick where they they spread their focus a little thin by concentrating on a yeah. variety of locations. I would also throw um, what's the second one? Diabolical Box, where your Diabolical train Box suffers yeah. from this a bit. Yes, and uh, yeah. the latest yeah, one, cause... Catriel uh, Layton's Mystery Journal, has something of the same problem. That's um, somewhat disappointing, but I am still interested in playing it. Uh, oh yeah, it's yeah. worth a play. Yeah. Um, 
I, I will say with diabolical blocks, I still think it works because you have this one like kind of rushing thing going forward and you have the people on the train to kind of connect it. There's very little connecting anything in the Azran. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still I'm still discombobulated by by the uh, by, by by that sacrificing stuff. I'm I, <laughs> you have really you have really put me uh, you know out of the loop here. If you have a better way oh. to please the wind god, I want to hear it. Oh man, I've created so many in Persona Five. I thought that they would already <laughs> be kind of cool with me. That's where you've been going wrong. You gotta make a sliding puzzle. <laughs> Fusion with sliding puzzles would be the worst idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Drive All me right. nuts. So, uh, Breakman, what have you been playing? Uh, like everybody else in quarantine, I've had a bit of time on my hands and have been playing um, quite a number of games, particularly as I worked on the Sonic article. I blazed a trail through um, a number of the Sonic the Hedgehog games I'd never played before and oh, uh, will it. not play again. Oh, yeah. but, <laughs> but oh, um, careful, is turning to Project Sonic Watch yet again. I, I already I love what I'm hearing. Yeah, no, actually, I did enjoy a few of them much more than I, I thought I would. I, I'm, I'm going to go to bat for Sonic Forces at any time that it comes up in the future, because for a game with a poor reputation, it is ludicrous. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a pretty is good time. Is that the one where you create your Sonic Sona? And oh, then... yeah. Oh, right, yeah. It's it's all in, you know, it's all the cards are on the table with Sonic Forces. It's <laughs> They they muse on, like, the horrors of war. Um, Sonic is tortured <laughs> is on an asteroid ahead of his, like, Is that the one with, like, the, like, the, the, the quote execution? where it's, like... Uh... Uh, yes, of course, nothing's one. good about this factor. That's why it's called War. Yes, it's incredible. Yep. It it has the best <laughs> cutscenes in the series. I can't get enough of them. It also has the goofiest main, the goofiest, dumbest, most wonderfully silly main theme of a series mostly known for goofy, dumb, wonderfully silly main themes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Sounds great. So yeah, you liked it. Yeah, you know, I did, and it's it's the one that I totally expected to uh, to not like, but. Um, you know, uh, certainly uh, Sonic Colors and uh, what do you call it? Sonic Generations were a hoot, as you would expect. But have those you, were about uh, the have only you discovered three your, thing, Have you discovered your inner Sonic Sona? Well, in, in the sense that I crafted the goofiest looking one that I could for <laughs> Sonic Forces, um, but couldn't manage to extract a picture from my PlayStation 4 to um, to include in the article. So, Aww. c'est la vie, you know, but just, he's got just... like... Rabbit Drawing ears and paper. gigantic sneakers and um, just a just, real. Uh, share your Deviant Art page and. and you're right. You're right. I should. I should do up. Uh, do up an image <laughs> on Deviant Art. Um, but more to the point. More to the point of the question. Um, what I have been uh, really sinking some time into lately is Yakuza Zero. Nice. Oh yeah, that's a fun uh, one. Which has this been covered very much on the podcast before? I don't recall hearing about it too we, much. I'm sure we've talked about the Yakuza series a couple of times, but I don't know a if we've talked bit. about Zero specifically. Yeah, well, um, so I'd obtained this some time ago, um, just based on uh, the, the the good impressions that I'd heard around it. Having never played a Yakuza game, period, though having enjoyed Shenmue quite a bit, this is going to oh. date me. But having enjoyed that back circa 2001. Uh, I'm just, uh, it's not dating you as much as I'm just judging you for liking Shenmue. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, telling no, that no. I have as not. As long as you didn't up. fund the Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, really painfully a product of its time and in yeah. all the best and worst ways. So um, does, it, does Yakuza remind you of Shenmue? Very much so. Yeah. It, it feels like a fulfillment of Shenmue's promise. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that it captures a lot of what worked about Shenmue. This, um, uh, you know, a lot like your your Persona 4's Inaba, mm-hmm. or um, you know that sort of thing, where you have this, or, or uh, Legend of Zelda Majora's Masks Termina, mm-hmm. where you have this sense of community and sense of humanity around the um, the characters that you're interacting with. Mm-hmm. Um, not quite to the extent of those games, in that. Um, you know, there's a much larger cast of background NPCs yeah. in Yakuza that don't really get developed uh, and just kind of serve to create this, uh, you know, a, a sense of, of, of shared culture and, and place. Whereas in, you know, uh, Majora's Mask or Persona 4, you get a much greater level of depth with your NPCs. Um, that said, the the central characters, the cutscenes are... Um, 
it just filled with this kind of warmth in Yakuza that there's this very rich specificity to it mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, all of these characters feel like, like they have a background, even if you don't get to explore it, they have very strong personalities. Yeah. Quite a bit of yeah. that's down to the motion capture. I suspect it's got, oh, yeah. especially main characters, really strong motion capture. I would say that it also like lets the scenes breathe. There's a lot of like, yes. um, yeah, there's a lot of like quiet moments when they can just like portray a character just drinking some alcohol in a, like a nice bar and all of this like all of their like body language does the does the uh, characterization for them. It's it's really yeah. good that way. Speaking to that, there's a little thing that they do um, that I really appreciate as far as kind of foregrounding the sense of community and sense of place, which is that um, one of the central mechanics to the game is this brawler combat that's not especially refined, in my opinion. And I like that since I'm pretty bad at action games. Hmm. But um, as your your player character grows wounded, um, you, you, know, you, you don't recover health outside of battle unless you eat food. Uh, and so one of the key ways to recover health ahead of, you know, your next potential fight, which you never know when it's coming, is to go to a restaurant, you know, a sushi restaurant, a ramen restaurant, a, a meat skewers restaurant, um, and just hang out and have some food. You know, sometimes they're karaoke joints, so you can uh, do some karaoke as like a little mini game after you eat. Oh, yeah, the um, karaoke cutscenes are fantastic. It's brilliant. It's utterly brilliant. And it it places that it makes the um, the building up of the sense of community and the sense of place of where this is occurring part and parcel with the mechanics of regaining health, which I yeah. think is a really nice way to, to force yeah. the player to engage with that. I, I would you start actually to feel like a regular at these establishments. Yeah, exactly. I would actually argue that the brawler part of the game is the least interesting thing about it. It's like the it's like not refined very much, and you mostly just power through it from what I've seen. Yeah, yeah, it feels not... like it was made for me in that you can you can kind of button mash and get through it, but also it separates the plot scenes just enough to get you yeah. kind of um, engaged. Yeah, it's not like it's not bad, but it is kind of rote, especially mm -hmm. when you're just fighting yeah. street thugs. Yeah, um, you kind of do need to get familiar with the battle system to get through some of the later boss fights. Otherwise, it'll be yeah. a little bit of a pain. And to beat um, and to beat Mr. Shakedown, that guy. Oh, yeah. oh I hate if that guy. If you don't yeah. understand, <laughs> if you don't understand the combat system, you can't take down Mr. Shakedown. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, I am so always you... prepared to bump down the difficulty to the lowest level possible. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, like you should not be playing a Yakuza game on a difficulty higher than normal. It's not. <laughs> there, um... I guarantee you, there are some people that will say, oh, "No, man, this like the, the beauty of this combat," and I'm like, "You cheated, no, yeah, you cheated yourself." It's sad you don't <laughs> yeah. even know the difference. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't care. I play them on normal or easy, depending on how much time I have. Yeah. So I, I don't have no a. I don't have a sh any, any shame in like bumping down the difficulty in any game. I'm like, oh, I'm not yeah. having fun. So, bop. Yeah, it varies pretty radically for me. A lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, what am I, what am I playing this for? So, you know, in in your, um, I don't know, some of your more technical action games, you know, the or even, gosh, some RPGs, uh, you're sort of playing it for the challenge. But then in other ones, you're playing it for the story, uh, certainly. And so, in this case, I'm playing it for the story. Yeah, as a crazy person, I started Persona Five Royal on on hard, and I was like, and like two hours Old later, choice. I was like, oh, no, 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 this was a dumb thing to do. Yeah, I that game even on normal was so hard that I ended up quitting it eventually. I mean, it's 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 sometimes on hard it feels unfairly hard in some respects, but I again, I'm not in it for for the action. I'm it, in for a story. So. Every, sure. Whatever difficulty you need or want is the difficulty yeah. you need or want. Precisely. Um, I, Accessibility. Uh, like a, yeah, I respect, say, the inclusion of things like permadeath in video games, but I already was attached enough to my to my Black Eagle family in Fire <laughs> Emblem last month. I'm not going to go through killing them. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, it's funny you should bring that up because um, I, I have put quite a bit of time into um, into Fire Emblem uh, Three Houses, a rock solid over 200 hours at this point, which shocks me. Um, nearly half of that is failed battles. 
um, oh. because I do have it set on the hardest difficulty oh, because that's my. one of those that that's what I enjoy about it. It's a special sickness. Yeah. Oh my lord! No, I I played forty hours of that game and I'm like I did, no I no I'm not enjoying it anymore. I think I'm like just going to bump it down. Yeah, to yeah. Play or something. But uh, with with regard to Yakuza Zero, just to uh, to wrap up my my spiel on this today, um, I have to put a plug in for it as a kind of ideal quarantine game. Um, mm. It's like there's a certain wistfulness. Uh, to just being out and, <laughs> you know, sure. th this really speaks to the time in which we live, isn't it? But being out and milling around the streets with these goofballs, oh, yeah. um, you know, getting into these little brawls on the street in uh, Kamurocho uh, in, in Japan and just going to a restaurant for Pete's sake um, yeah. is a lot more enjoyable than it would be under different circumstances. So uh, Yakuza Zero is really kind of keeping a smile on my face here in the Breakman household. Nice. Nice. Yeah, um, I, I've actually got Yakuza 3 on the docket, and I'm going to be firing that up in a couple of weeks, so I'll be back into the fun of touring virtual Japanese cities. Cool. Um, yeah, nice. Um, what would be a good first Yakuza game to get? Zero. Okay. Yeah, it's the only one that I've played, and I love it. It's hard for me to imagine other ones in the series. This one is so kind of singular. Uh, wow. the, okay. It started with so... Zero because it like, starts the story, and then you have it's the first remake basically then you have kiwami which is one right merv i'm, I'm, I'm yeah. all right so the way okay so oh god no wait no <laughs> i forgot no. okay you for really nine if you want to understand 99 percent of what's going on start with zero and then kiwami then kiwami 2 and then the rest of the series in order um but if you're just like one of those people who's like, I need to understand 100% of what's going on and understand every reference. Then the only way to play the games would be uh, to play like the original Yakuza 1 and Yakuza 2 on the oh, PS2. No, but no, no. Don't, don't do that. Just no. start with zero. You'll understand 99% of what's going on. You'll miss yeah. a couple Perfect. of references and a few conversations will be a little weird. But other than that, it's completely fine. So go zero to one. The Come games on. are... Uh, the remakes are so much better. Yeah. Yeah. They're gorgeous too. I love how these oh, games yeah. look and uh, the, just the performance on the PS4. It's just a silky smooth 60 frames per second. Yeah. Except for cutscenes. Yeah. They dropped that for Kiwami too because they went to the new engine. Um, so that runs at 30 FPS. But oh, you're breaking my heart. Kiwami Marv. 1 are, <laughs> yeah, butter smooth 60 FPS experiences, even on a base PS4. Um, I think they're. I think they're all 60 FPS on on PC. They're all 60 FPS in my heart. There you go. <laughs> uh, so Kappa, what have you been playing? Well, I built a monster of a computer. So I did that thing where you go, "What can I play on this that's going to look amazing?" Or you oh, know, yeah. kind of like. And so I revisited one of 2019's big disappointments for me, which is uh, Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Um, I think that was a big disappointment for literally everyone. <laughs> damn it. Ubisoft did it again. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it? Um, it's, it's not perfect, but they released a 2.0 patch that is basically a continuation of the story, but really just breaks from the original story. And it introduces you to... Uh, well, your your character reintroduces them to Sam Fisher, and it's basically one big extended episode of Splinter Cell, and I enjoyed the shit out of it. Um, is it, it is it the, the cutscene with Sam Fisher referencing M M Solid Snake? Is it is it that one? I don't think I don't know if he does. I I'm not as into Metal Gear as other. Okay, I'm there's a there's like. a. Yeah, there's a cutscene where Sam Fisher c comes in, and yeah, there was one more guy with a bandana that also did oh, this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, that's the one. All right. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, uh, Sam Fisher's back, and they basically kind of do the whole thing that we're going to talk about, and they get a little bit of Splinter Cell in my Ghost Recon. Now, I, I'm a Tom Clancy series junkie, right? And so in my mind, what was always the difference between the series was Ghost Recon is, you know, you try to be stealthy. When it doesn't work, you go loud, you know, as they say. And, you know, your silencer's off and you're spraying bullets everywhere. Whereas if you do that in a Sam Fisher game, you know, or a Splinter Cell game, you fail the mission usually, right? So, like, stealth is the point. So I was yeah. interested to see how they were going to kind of handle that mix, um, I guess. And they do it pretty well. Uh, the missions have, like, a large part where you have to sneak in successfully, kind of like an insertion-type scenario, but once you're in, 
Um, you don't actually play with Sam. He's kind of like the guy on the radio helping you out and stuff. Um, but once you're in, uh, more often than not, what you get is Sam covering you or guiding you through the intel or things like that. Um, but it's you know it's it's cool to go back. Splinter Cell is one of my favorite series that I think kind of is mostly dead. But this yeah. started to kind of uh, kind of put some some ways that I can see it coming back now. Uh, yeah, which that's, is good. That's just... why the the cutscene with him referencing Metal Gear Solid was like on, I watched it on YouTube and I was like, yep, stealth <laughs> games are kind of dying out because he was like, yeah, that guy with the bandana, and she was like, oh, I heard, oh. I heard you, uh, he retired, and she's like, "Oh, it's only me now." And it's like, <laughs> like the second of him realizing that that his era is almost over, and it's a, it's a sad moment in this yeah. game. Oh. It, 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 there, there's a lot of kind of throwbacks that you know Sam Fisher hasn't had the best of lives if you if you follow the Splinter Cell series, and there's a is lot he, of little references to that is too. Is he still voiced by the same yeah. guy? Yeah, and he sounds a fair deal older, um, which is cool. Um, Ironside, Iron, Ironside. I think oh, that's Iron... his name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he and but so you're you're dealing with kind of like a grizzled Sam Fisher who's kind of yeah. given up. Um, the story is continued from uh, Ghost Recon, so you're back on the island. Uh, you're trying to figure out the CIA basically stuck Sam Fisher on this island for some reason, and you know through a series of double crosses and triple crosses and quadruple crosses. Yeah. There's a lot of crosses. I love Uh, it. uh, Eventually kind of Sam figures out that he was put on this Island basically as a trap. Um, because they figured that he couldn't get off because of all the other events going on in the series. Um, so that's interesting to me though. Um, that, you know, that at least they've, they've done some more stuff with Sam than they had in the past. But, uh, where the story goes is kind of in some, some different places, but if people want to play it, go for it. It was more me trying to get a game that would just basically, I could put on RTX everything and ray tracing and a million different things. And it looks oh, gorgeous. That, um, that game has ray, tra- ray tracing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, nice. It's got a lot of, it was a lot of the early RTX feature, features were available in it. Uh, it looks great. Sounds great. They, they do this thing where like, there's like ambient weather that kind of blows in. And you'll yeah. be sitting in a place and like all of a sudden, like almost a hurricane will blow and the trees will start swaying and the fog and the mist will roll through. And it looks it looks really good. The um, first time I ever saw something like that was in The Witcher 3. And I remember mm-hmm. being absolutely blown away by trees swaying with incoming yeah. breezes. Yeah. It's yeah. good to hear that, that people are still, yeah. you know, doing the, stuff the, with that. Like Skyrim is like a really static game in comparison. So, yeah, the first time I also like seen Witcher, I'm like, oh, there's weather. Yeah, wow. I I think mine was Tomb Raider, but a lot, like 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 everyone's saying, I think you really you, you notice that effect, and it, it's like wow, I'm I'm sitting yeah. here like kind of in, on a hill looking down on somebody, you know, getting ready to snipe them or whatever, and then you start so, to see it roll in, and it's it's cool. Yeah. yeah. So so I have a question. Sure. Uh, this is an open world game, more mm-hmm. or less, and the Splinter Cell games are more like focused on like you know corridor yeah. game, and like how these. How do these two things like mash up? Are yeah, they like... we'll, we'll, yeah, I know the whole point of, but yeah, I, I think here's how it does it well. So Sam meets you. You meet him at his bunker, and you always have to meet him at night. You know, lots of the other open world stuff is like whenever you show up, the mission starts, right? You have to meet Sam at a secret bunker at night, and it's all set up like a Splinter Cell house would be, right? So right. he's sitting in there, and he says, "Look, you know, we got to go do this. We got to go do that. Here's the mission." Um, he gives you parameters for the mission, basically, and there's a new play style in the game. So uh, Ghost Recon has play styles. Um, so you've got assault. You just use you know, machine guns and roll in and shoot everybody. You don't even bother sneaking versus the sniper versus the engineer versus. So he gives you a new tactic is what the game calls it, which is echelon. So you can fight like an echelon person, which is very much sneaking and gathering intel and getting in and out without getting seen and stuff like that. Cool. So. He gives you that tactic, and in order to really do his missions, you've got to level up that tactic, first of all, mm. and which all involves around, you know, getting hand cannon, or not hand cannon, uh, play too much Destiny, getting pistol kills from a certain distance, unseen, and hiding the body, or, or things like that. Fairy Splinter Cell playstyle yeah. type things. Um, after that, so you level that up enough, and you start to talk to him, and he really starts to give you, like, his missions, but the way they enforce his playstyle is 
like I said, like you have to get to the computer that you need to hack unseen, right? right? After you hack it, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can play Ghost Recon style if you want. But um, what he'll do is he'll overwatch you. So uh, if you get if you fail a stealth area in like one section, like the big boss section, he'll snipe them for you so that, you mm -hmm. know, you get a couple freebies in, on getting found because Ghost Recon doesn't have that refined stealth system. Right. Kind of, by, by purpose it's not that type of yeah. game really so they do a lot of mechanics wise to, to enforce that echelon style of play which is the so, Sam Fisher style the level design uh, mm -hmm. is it more like oh you enter this like secret facility or it's yeah. like oh yeah. so they, they put you in a lot more corridors in the game itself okay. um, one of them like one of the big ones takes place in a power plant Sam went around and placed mines on like the, mm -hmm. these pipes and you have to figure out how to get from mine to mine on these pipes and detonate them without getting seen, um, but also shooting the mine so it doesn't get heard, uh, which is kind of a fun way to play if you think about it, you know, because you're, you're hopping from mine to mine and taking out people and going. It's it's very methodical. It feels very Splinter Cell. So uh, I think this was kind of maybe a test run, mm -hmm. you know, to see, like, how this works and how this doesn't, because I think Ubi is all in on open world games. Oh, yeah. I think they want Sam to come back, and I think this has been kind of their introduction. And it's kind of an interesting story, too, because Ghost Recon Breakpoint sucked. It, it was a failure. And again, I mean, I, I don't know when I'll stop being surprised that, that Ubi is doing this, but they're putting is, effort into reviving is, their... Is this the game that they also like put a, the, the Predator in? Uh, it has the Terminator. The last oh, one had the okay. Predator in it. This yeah, one has right. the Terminator, uh, which is a real fun side mode, by the way. Um, oh, but that's it's got, great. It's got John Barenthal in it. Um, so it, the story, just real rough uh, catch up on it, is think if uh, Mark Zuckerberg went crazy, bought a uh, island and stocked it full of a PMC mercenaries while developing evil AI that could conquer the world, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so just Mark describing... Zuckerberg became Elon Musk. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. I, I was just going to say you were describing just Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> so because of that, the last one had Predator. It was set in Bolivia in the jungles, and they had Predator. And this one has Terminator in it, which is kind of a fun crossover because it's like, well, he saw the, basically saw the movie Terminator and decided he could do that. And, you know, you actually start facing real Terminators who go back in time to try to stop a pre-Terminator program. But... Um, the 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 game itself though is 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 rebooted. Uh, they they fucked up a lot of basic Ghost Recon things when it launched, and they've gone through and basically re pulled almost every single one of them out uh, and replaced it with a little bit going back to what the core of the series was, which is uh, an open world military shooter, not an open world stealth game, or not a looter shooter, not all the other things they kind of tried to shoehorn into it. Um, so it's in a better place if you're just looking for that experience now, but you know, it, it's hard because with Ubisoft now, I've kind of get to the point where I'm like, well, let them fix the game first and I'll, <laughs> I'll check it out. Yeah. So, um, it'll be interesting. I don't think that that about Assassin's Creed, I think they've got that formula nailed, but a lot of their other stuff has just been, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling to get it right. And they're, they're making changes, but it's not the changes that people want and it's changes in weird directions. So, uh, going from one of my biggest disappointments last year to actually enjoying this new Sam Fisher episode was, was a pretty big shift. Um, so I don't know if I'd recommend buying the whole game for a Sam Fisher episode, but if you bought it like me and you've been fiending for some more Splinter Cell, uh, it's there. Um, cool. you might enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, that's cool to hear. I didn't. I wasn't aware that they um, that Splinter Cell was uh, that that anybody was doing anything with Splinter Cell lately. So it's cool to hear that they found a way to tie it into um, you know a, a pretty popular property. Yeah, he had a little cameo in the uh, one before this Wildlands, which I think was also rumored to be his rebirth. But I don't think that one worked as well as this one. The integration does. So I think they're still tinkering with that formula because if you think of it, like I think. Um, you you were saying uh, it's a very linear game, uh, Splinter Cell. If you think about it, it's like okay, yeah. we're in the embassy. How do we get from point A to point B? Uh, that's not what Ubisoft is really doing anymore. So I, I still think they're trying to find out how it works, and this might be attempt number two to to figure out how it works in their their new open world, you know, uh, genre. Yeah, because the last mainline Splinter Cell game was back in 2013. That was yeah. Blacklist. <laughs> And I it, am. I apologize. The uh, the Splinter Cell, Cell uh, Metal Gear Solid mention was in Wildlands. Oh, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's uh, th- there was also a Sam Fisher uh, game, um, cameo in that. Yeah, he, and that that one, it, it, like I said, I don't think it worked as well. I think yeah. that one was very much more just like, oh, look, it's Sam Fisher. This one was yeah, more yeah. like, all right, let's figure out how his gameplay would be in this this world uh, by giving you that tactic, that echelon tactic. You can really start to feel like the it's almost like an XP skill. So. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it's worth checking out if you're just fiending for. It. But like you said, uh, Conviction seems like forever ago, and that story has, was going places. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it was just kind of people lost interest or the, the genre kind of fell had the bottom fall out. But yeah. uh, it'd be interesting yeah. to see if it starts to, to kind of get them back on the road to a comeback. Yeah, stealth genres kind of, um, kind of disappeared from the mainstream. Uh, mostly for worse, I'd say. Yeah. So it'll be nice to see like a full fledged stealth game kind of make a comeback if they want to reboot Splinter Cell. Who yeah. Knows? Um. So Cap was mentioning crossovers, um, and I've actually been playing a crossover lately. Nice. And that crossover is Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp Fe, which is a mashup of which is on on paper a mashup of Persona and um fire oh, emblem yeah i can't speak to how much fire emblem is actually in it because i've never played a fire emblem game i'm yeah. coming at this Mer- from Mer- a perspective. I, I i feel like you've been playing this for like years now i don't know <laughs> it feels it's a like... long game <laughs> yeah maybe but like haven't you like uh, wh- where you're at with that i'm near the end now oh, okay i think okay. last time i mentioned it i was near the start oh, okay um, now i'm near the end uh, I also take forever to play JRPGs because I play like three, three other games at the same time. So it's a uh, so it's a straight up JRPG, right? With the JRPG combat. Yeah, yeah, it's so it's it's supposed to have like Persona combat. I'd really say um, the setup of the game is a lot more like Digimon Story than mm-hmm. it is like Persona. Yeah. But not enough people have played Digimon Story for that comparison to make any sense. <laughs> yeah, you're so. making me want to play Digimon Story you, now. You have recommended oh, Digimon Cyber Story is a Sleuth. much better game than Tokyo Mirage Sessions. You have recommended Cyber Sleuth over and over again, and you're wearing me down. I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> Just slowly. Um, I say, if you, Cyber Sleuth is great if you like Digimon. If you're not into Digimon at all, it's not going to convince you. Man, I was um, super into Digimon like 15 20 years ago so i'm not sure if i would find myself in that game oh you you would it would bring back the nostalgia okay Mm. um but anyway the the whole premise is uh, i think i mentioned this on a podcast episode previously the whole premise is that uh you work for a talent agency that employs a bunch of idols and actors and you use the power of performance to defeat monsters who are trying to take over the world i think i don't know what they're doing the plot makes no sense that old plot Jeez, yeah up with something new <laughs> never yeah so the combat is very much your typical jrpg combat where you try to find uh weaknesses to uh your attacks and then exploit them if you exploit weaknesses you get additional attacks in uh the Persona games, as they're known as baton passes, um, in the uh, uh, sorry, Tokyo Mirage sessions, they're known as session attacks. That's basically the entire combat system. In between combat, you walk around Tokyo and talk to people and run errands for them. It's a pretty simple kind of setup for a game. Uh, as for what's Fire Emblem about it, some of the weapon weaknesses, I think, are lifted from Fire Emblem for all the physical attacks. Yeah. And then the aesthetics of some of the dungeons and the, uh, like, your... Uh, your personas your, are also... Your great. personas are, are lifted from Fire Emblem. Yeah, they're, they're like main characters from Fire Emblem in, games. Uh, sorry? They're, yeah, they're all uh, main characters from Fire Emblem games, if memory serves. Right, you're a... Uh, Mirages, that's what they're called. You can tell how seriously I'm invested in this game. (laughs) Yeah, I guess that's what it's called. I don't know. I've been playing this game only for 100 hours. Uh, I'm on hour 50. That's not so bad. Um, I'm ready for it to be over. Um, 
Sorry, so... Wolfman, you 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 were trying to say something? Oh yeah, no, I was just interested to, because, like, as someone who, you know, I've been playing, I was playing Fire Emblem Heroes for a very long amount of time, but um, Three Houses is like the first time I've immersed myself seriously into a Fire Emblem game, so I'm just kind of interested in trying to figure out what actually got taken. Like, my understanding is that some of the not personas are Fire Emblem characters, but a lot of them aren't Fire Emblem characters. Um, yeah, it's mostly just what they've taken from Fire Emblem are some of the aesthetics for the dungeons, some of the Mirage characters, and weapon weaknesses, and some late game plot related stuff that I won't spoil. But otherwise it's it's a lot more persona than it is Fire Emblem, but it's even not that much persona. It's really more like like a Digimon story or a Caligula <laughs> effect or something like that. Man, yeah, that's... having played the um the Fire Emblem series, the Persona series and Tokyo Mirage sessions, um I would agree agree entirely with that assessment. It's very little Fire Emblem, a bit of Persona and a fair amount of its own thing. Okay, D- Merv, do you do you like it? <laughs> I mean, I think you could. Uh, I think <laughs> what I'll say about it is that. Eh? Okay, that's how it feels a big, like a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's how it feels. I don't like. hate it, but I also think it's really dumb. Yeah. And the only <laughs> reason I'm still playing it is because I'm a completionist who can't stop. That's, it, like... that's kind of what I kind of like. I started playing this game because I really like Persona and I kind of like Fire Emblem. So I was like, hey, you know, I said, why, why not? And then, like, five hours in, I was like, you know, this, this seems really dumb. And yeah, it's I a real just... C plus B minus. Yeah, I just stopped. It playing. never gets better. That's okay. the problem with it. That's, I always, that's good. I, I'm not even like, I like. Let's let's face it. I'm a stupid, incorrigible weeaboo. I I like. I should live be living for this shit. Like I should. I mean, I'm not like into J-pop, um, but like I should be, you know, giddy with excitement at, at playing through this kind of thing. And it's just worn me down because it's such a boring game. Sure. That's, yeah. that's good to hear, though, because I, it's good that I didn't go further with it. Because I would be so, like, oh, 50 hours in, I, it's, the story still hasn't gotten very good. It's kind of segue I mean, to, can, to... Sorry, go ahead. And 50, per, and 50 hours in is when Fire Emblem and Persona stories are supposed to get good. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. That's fair. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. Say... I, I'm just poking fun of yeah, 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 yeah. So to segue this into the main topic of the episode, uh, what I'll say about this game is that it's a little bit difficult for me to speak to its success as a crossover because it I haven't played one half of the games it's coming from. Um, but just as a video game, I would not say it's super successful. Yeah. Uh, but... Just to open up now, what are some video game crossovers that you folks actually have enjoyed? Well, um, yeah. oh yeah, go go ahead, Wolfman. I no, can. Uh... No, you go, please. Okay, please. Sign. I just have a pretty short one because, speaking of, uh, well, we spoke about Metal Gear Solid a while ago, and in Metal Gear Solid Three, there's a mini game where you catch apes, apes from <laughs> Ape Escape. Yes, and, you're right, <laughs> man. It, I what? All about that. Yeah, it's like the funniest shit, and I loved it when I first played it. I was like, "This is amazing." The colonel t- talks about like, "Catch those apes, snake," and it's it, it's really as as silly as Metal Gear Solid gets. It never gets this silly, so it's it was very much fun to he- hear the colonel and uh, and snake talk about catching apes, um, and it's the, it, it's Metal Gear Solid three gameplay. But there's like actual apes from Ape Escape uh, running around, like different stages taken from Metal Gear Solid Three. So even, even in the very dramatic last stage where like you you fight with the boss with the flower field, there's a bunch of apes like goofing around, and you have to oh, catch wow. them. Yeah, it's really silly. I love it. Um, so it's like on the actual Metal Gear Solid Three maps. It, just it, apes yeah, around? yeah. It's 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 an additional mode in the subsistence uh, version of Metal Gear Solid Three. So it came out with two two discs, 
And on one of the discs, the additional mode is what like was, oh, Metal Gear Solid 3 Ape Escape. And you can like, yeah, load it up and you have like 10 levels and uh, you load those levels and it's like, oh, this is the, yeah, this is the, this is the flower field map where you have to catch like 15 apes. If you, you know, have a uh, if you have a PlayStation yeah. Three, this is also all available on the Metal Gear Solid Legacy Collection, which is one of the mm-hmm. best uh, bangs for your buck you can get. Yeah. So you know what this kind of reminds me of? The original Watch Dogs hat mm-hmm. was like the super po faced self serious game. Yeah. But it had these VR um, virtual, not like actual VR, but VR in the game. Yeah. Uh, or AR mini games. Where one of them was like you played as a giant spider tank, just like <laughs> running through the streets of Chicago, and it was so completely silly and totally at odds with the rest of the game. Nice, and it was the only part of the game that was actually fun. Yeah, <laughs> I had never heard about that mode. That makes me more interested in Watch Dogs than I previously had been. <laughs> Don't play the original Watch Dogs, it's crap. Watch Dogs, too. Like, <laughs> Watch Dogs, I've heard Watch Dogs 2 is quite good. Yeah, I've yeah, only heard good things. It. I enjoyed it a lot. So yeah, that's, that was my uh, that was the one I remembered when you were like, ah, oh, mashups. I was like, man, that one that one was pretty silly and pretty fun. Like that's that was a good decision by Konami. Like the, the, you know they 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 did some they did some stupid ones, stupid decisions here and there, but in their prime, just a few stupid decisions. Yeah, <laughs> just a couple. Just a, just a, just a <laughs> tiny bit here and there, but uh, but uh, mostly pachinko based. But like, uh, yeah. But this one, I yeah, I loved it. I loved it, and I hold it dear in my heart. When I when I remember it, I smile. So it's it's a good one. If I could build on that just slightly, um, without really going into this, because we could, you know, this could be its its own entire crossover segment, and I don't intend it to be. But uh, your your reference to the colonel's sort of um, flavor text about the apes reminds me of. Um, in the uh, some of the Super Smash Brothers games where Snake yes. is in it, and you've got Otakon, um, his ally, giving these like I don't know, kind of painfully absurd yeah. readings of classic yeah. Nintendo characters over the <laughs> uh, the radio. It's pretty great. Yeah. The yeah uh, yeah those are all pretty uniformly fantastic, um, and they go from like and not just the Snake ones too, because there's also Star Fox ones and Kid Icarus ones that. And they also they also include their own secret bonus characters like uh, Slippy hangs out with uh, uh, hangs out with a uh, snake for for the for one of their conversations. Uh, wow, I had no idea about any of this. Up. Yeah, um, f- the one for a Richter Belmont Pitt and Palutena talk to Alucard. Um, oh, cool. It, it was cut from Ultimate, but in uh, Smash for Wii U, to they actually. For Robin, they have a whole conversation where Crom shows up and everyone makes fun of him for how he's too similar to Marth. <laughs> nice, 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 uh, sick burn on Chrome. Oh, um, yeah, but um, yes, uh, Smash would actually, as a whole, would be my answer for um, for a few reasons because I mean, partially it's it's kind it's of stuff the ultimate like. crossover. Yeah. But it's also like it doesn't just cross over like characters or the locations they're from. It also crosses over all different kinds of weird like mechanics and different kinds yeah. of like weird ephemeral stuff. Like, it, like you have characters like Olimar who actually try to match the mechanics of their decidedly not fighting game series, while you also have things like the trophies or the spirits that basically lead to, like. Did you know that Nintendo had like a, a Journey to the West like visual novel like proto visual <laughs> novel game for the Famicom Disk System? Nice. Not until today. I didn't. Smash. Not until right now. <laughs> yeah. Nope. There's a, a spirit and there's a musical medley that's based on that. Like nice. it, it's chock full of basically not just like the the crossover stuff that's very obvious, but everything else just kind of like fills it like. When like almost like toxic when toxic water and like an early Lovecraft story like <laughs> contaminates all of the the lake into being into being toxic, like every <laughs> you, actually I realize this. Is, sorry, no, you uh, just wanted to say that you know what like they they do treat all of that with like all the care and love that they they obviously care for every every character they put in in that game and I I love it when the villager from Animal Crossing attacks with like 
chopping down a tree. It's like yes. so there's some crazy things in that game that like just were specifically very imaginatively put in there as like either attacks or special moves to just match the game and the flavor of the game that, that like, the character. Uh, we fit trainer. Like yeah. That, that was yeah. always when I um, thought was like, okay, that was that was very smart. Yeah. The yeah, and because it's in that case, it's like she's not just using moves from her game, which of course are all mostly just actual like yoga poses, yeah, and uh, see part like stances and yoga um movement sequences, but they also have like the unique effect of having distinct hitboxes, which is what's like we fit trainers, what's considered her biggest strength in the actual competitive circuit is the fact that her moves all have very weird like hit very weird spaces that don't really make sense in any kind of normal game. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Just yoga, you know? She's very flexible. Uh, I always think of the um, the Dragon Quest hero in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate as kind of the, the biggest fulfillment of this to me in that in a real-time one-on-one fighting game, game that character's moveset is based on menus. Just brilliant. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's, it's very good. Very imaginative. I'm just sad that they didn't find a place to put the buff dragon from Ring Fit Adventure in Smash Bros. Oh, he is yet. Um, actually, oh, Drago is in there now? Not as a character, but as a spirit. They've been adding spirit, like bonus spirits and spirit oh, fights. Oh, fantastic. The game, which includes Ring Fit Adventure, Tetris, um, uh, Resident Evil, for some reason. Sure, um, that one made me really happy. Yeah. Love it. So uh, I should mentioned that literally the second Google search result, if you search for Drago, is already people want to boink the ring, the ring fit dragon Drago. Oh, okay. Um, huh. So, I mean, boy, that's the internet for you. Yep. Yeah, they yeah. sexualize that is result everything. result number two. Yep. I mean, he's kind of, you know, a very, he's a fetching young man and sure. he's clearly upwardly mobile. So yeah, I get it. Right. Just like maybe, maybe ease it down internet on the horniness, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> you could do worse. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 you know, let drag go, go for it. Um, That's how we move on to the next segment. Uh, no, I was, okay, was going to bring up one. I, I, I feel like this one is almost like completely wiped from people's memories, even though it should have been a gigantic series for lots of reasons. And that was Lego dimensions. Um, I don't know if oh. anybody messed with that, played with that at all. Yeah, I've seen it. it. Lego has a surprising amount of like the franchises. Yeah. Uh, so they could have like, yeah, we've got Lord of the Rings here and back to the future. And like, who knows what? Like, we have everything, yeah. basically. It, it really was. I mean, it really was everything. Um, they threw everything, in, in, you know, that you could imagine uh, in that game. I, Lego has lots of properties, but this was their attempt, I think, to kind of really um, break into that at the time, which was, I think, a pretty profitable market, which was that Disney Infinity sweet spot. Do you know yeah, what, what is that? Toys to Life. Yeah. 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 And um, I, I think there was there was some ups and downs there, right? Um, like you had to buy a lot of the toys, and there was a lot of overlap. Um, the toys themselves were Lego toys, but the idea was cool. They had a scanner in it. Uh, you could build, like, let's say the Batmobile, right? Um, and then the Batmobile would have certain abilities, but then you'd unlock enough points, and you would unlock a secondary mode for the Batmobile. So you would rebuild your Lego toy to right the but, sonic batarang or whatever and then okay that... could i have one question about the whole how it worked kind of thing sure so did one piece of lego had an nfc chip in it no it was in the base so what you would do is you would basically tell the game hey i have built the bat car into the oh. sonic car now and then you would rebuild it. Now, you didn't always have to, right? You could okay. technically play this thing without the Legos at all if you just have a bunch of those NFC chips from the yeah. bottom. Um, and you just say, yeah, this is the back car. There doesn't have to be a Lego on it. The game doesn't know. Okay. Um, so that part of it was you know, kind of hit and miss, I guess. But depending on if, how you were feeling... Um, you know, with with my kid, I would always build the things because that was fun for us. You know, oh, cool, let's build it. the back car. Yeah, 
let's build the bat car into a bat hydrofoil now. Okay, cool. Um, but then we wouldn't necessarily do that every single time. It was like, okay, I just need this one guy to be this one thing this one time. Um, but then he's going to go back to being, you know, the, this mode. Um, so I, I think some of that was a little bit hit and miss, but the, the games themselves had uh, like a hub world. And off of that hub world was basically every property <laughs> from the eighties and nineties you'd be interested in was basically built off of there. Um, they didn't do in some of their main tie-ins. I don't think they did like the Harry Potters or the, um, the uh, uh, star Wars or anything like that. But some of the other stuff, it was just I they mean, do. They did have Harry Potter. I'm did they? Right now. Okay. Not not Star Wars, but yes, Harry Potter. Yeah, it might it might and have also came Jurassic late. World. When, yeah. when I when I felt like it was kind of like a uh, like not hitting the mark, I feel like they started to pump a little bit more energy into some of the franchises that were there. Uh, initially, it was kind of like a bunch of Lego properties, and then they a bunch had of... Portal. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. like Crazy. with like really... actual dialogue from Gladys. Mm-hmm. And and it was That's all incredible. done really well um i bet you you could get this game for five bucks right now um and if you got enough of those blank nfc things and and enough people who tell you what to do you could have whatever you want uh, i routinely find packs of lego dimension stuff at the dollar store now um so if it's something that you're thinking about getting into check it out but like i said this was kind of a weird phase i feel like a lot of game gaming companies were trying to look into this toys as as a game thing um it, it didn't really catch on i don't think i think it it had spots here and there but i never really saw that um i think by by that point there was like saturation of the market when it comes to to these games and and it was expensive like nobody talks about skylanders anymore that's like a dead thing uh starlink pivoted away from toys to life Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah, starlink was a little late to the table yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Starlink's fantastic, though. I will say that. I, I enjoyed yeah. my time with that a lot. Um, I've heard best Star Fox game in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so I, I think that that, that one kind of gets forgot about, not necessarily because it was a great game, but also because of the toys as a as a thing. Um, but if you want to talk about a crossover series that, that I mean, short of something like uh, Smash Brothers, I mean, just had it all. I mean, it just – you could – you know, run a mission with a, a Scooby Doo, Marty McFly, and and the and the Simpsons TV in your party. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, you totally was... sold me on this. I was entirely unaware of this game or property until you've just told me about this. But this is so up my alley. It, it's, it's fantastic. It's really with cool. Kids do. It is. Um, and so, but the... you have to collect a, a bunch of crap for it. So just just FYI, uh, you, you can. Hey, find... I'm an American. Collecting crap <laughs> is what I do. Uh-huh. Now's probably the time to get into it if you ever were going to, honestly, because of, I mean, the the aftermarket right now is probably like Beanie Babies in 2007. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you'll be able to find exactly what you want when you want. But the the, the toys themselves are, are Legos. They're not like some weird knockoff, not exactly Lego thing. Um, you know, so even just having the little minifigures to pop into your le- normal Lego builds are pretty fun. Um, you know, I think as my kid kind of phased off of it, all the all the Simpsons, you know, still have a little spot on his Legos that he still builds. So um, it's so now I think one of the reasons to it kind of felt what I wanted to bring up was the way they tried to sell it. And I, I see this sometimes with crossovers where it's almost like uh, there's the game and then there's the crossover mode and the two don't really mesh well. Right. Yeah. Um, so with with the Lego dimensions, what they try to do is they had to so you could have characters you could just put in anywhere. Right. And then they also had this version called Fun Packs, which would give you not just the characters, but also their stage. So like for The Simpsons, for example, you would go to uh, the Chili Cook-Off, right? That was like their big setting, right? Which yeah. is yeah. cool and iconic and everything. But it made sense for The Simpsons characters I'm to be there. I'm missing the cook-off. <laughs> um, and I, I think that that's one thing that I think a lot of crossover games can do right and do wrong is when you try to shove – characters outside of their element it's either got to be completely crazy like we were talking about with metal gear and just embrace how how insane it is to do it or it has to make sense why those characters are there uh, if you're kind of trying to go a little bit more serious with it um and and lego had a hard time balancing how that worked for a lot of the characters because um why was marty mcfly in 
Springfield? I don't know. I mean, yeah. when you try to but, answer that question, it drives you crazy. But what's, just... what's cool, though, is that from what I, the portal thing that I saw, is that Gladys had a lot of comments about, like, various characters from other franchises. Yes, absolutely. A lot of them do that. They, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of talking um, where, you know, they, they put effort into the dialogue. Um to, to basically have the characters say things to each other that felt believable and felt funny. Um, and like how they would interact, the villains would talk to the villains about villain stuff. Uh, the, uh, heroes would talk about hero stuff. The Scooby-Doo characters would talk about like, you know, just little things here and there that, that were really, really, really funny, uh, interactions. Yeah. Uh, so I've got one of these crossovers to bring up here. Um, sure. Kingdom Hearts. Uh, oh. The, uh, oh boy! Yeah, one of one of the ultimate. <laughs> I crossovers. have not heard about this game. I'm not <laughs> um, sure. So I, I'm coming at this from kind of a weird perspective in that I have only played the first Kingdom Hearts mm-hmm. and about half of the second Kingdom Hearts. I'm like I'm the world's most casual Kingdom Hearts fan. So what is this Kingdoms of Hearts you have? Uh, yeah, played? so Kingdom so Hearts picture is, like uh, a suite of heart cards, and okay. you know, it's a kingdom made up entirely of those. Oh, I, I did that once. Yeah, there you go. So Kingdom That's... Hearts is a it's a crossover between uh, mostly Final Fantasy and Disney. Yeah. Um, but also Einhander and the World Ends With You. Sure. Somewhere in the franchise. Why not? Yeah, anyway. and it's it's a weird example. Um, so it, it, it changes and then over time, Mickey really. Mickey Mouse, it looks yes, like yeah. a ghost person and says that he wants to show you the door to darkness or whatever. I'm... The mashup Euro videos of the weirdest shit in Kingdom Hearts is the most <laughs> is the best thing about Kingdom Hearts, I think, still. Yeah. Kingdom Hearts is one of those things that succeeds in spite of itself. Listen, um, if you haven't played Kingdom Hearts, is it's it's basically a JRPG. It's basically a JRPG. Action JRPG. Yeah, yeah action. It's not basically a JRPG. It is a JRPG. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, with, with, with action in it. I'm like saying not 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 the classic one with like turn based. Oh yeah. Like, it's yeah. not like turn based. It's an action JRPG. Yeah, yeah action JRPG. And so one of the things that I find JRPG. intriguing about Kingdom Hearts is that um, you know, in, in contrast to things like your your Marvel versus Capcoms or your Smash Brothers or um maybe even your Lego dimensions to a certain extent. Um, it takes its uh, its sort of internal fiction very seriously, uh, yeah. for better and for worse. But it drives me nuts that they don't like that when they meet the characters from Disney, they they just kind of like never acknowledge the crazy shit. It's like you go with the story that they have in those games when it comes to those movies, and then you just go, just that's it. You go. It, it plays out how it has to play yeah, out. Yeah, it just takes it at face value. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. no, we have this end of the world shit going on. Join me in the war or something. You have freezing <laughs> powers. So Kingdom Hearts 2 um, kind of acknowledges that there's crazy shit going on everywhere. The other Kingdom Hearts games I've played are very much like you said. Yeah, have. that's, that's yeah. crazy. Like, it drives me insane. I know why, basically. But pr- probably Disney was like, no, nah, we don't want too much for you to do too much with our licenses. But I'm like, my, I want yeah, to see... Yeah, we don't want to down, see... Uh, yeah. Everything I've read about Kingdom Hearts development leads you to believe that Disney has been extremely permissive oh, with what interesting. they Oh, interesting. Then why didn't have they... Squeeze it with it. Winnie the Pooh murder someone. I want to see <laughs> that. Come on. It, 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 that's the thing, though, is that, and I'm saying this as someone who's never played a Kingdom Hearts game, it feels as though the actual crossover part of the crossover is the point of of, of least interest to its creator and brain 100%. guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's all like you're that's never going to see like Mulan hanging out it. with Pluto. Yeah. yeah, that's the problem. What? So this it's is a... this is what I really wanted to to kind of get into with Kingdom Hearts here, and I'm happy you brought it up, Wolf, uh, Wolfman. Is that it's this, you know, tragic is too strong a word, but it's this really sort of peculiar example of a crossover where it starts out ostensibly as a crossover between a bunch of these different properties and that's that's the premise right you know you've got your final fantasy and your disney and so forth but then with each subsequent entry it gets more kind of down its own rabbit hole of internal characters Uh, yes that's another way to put it (laughs) because oh it's straight up like it's literally just 
extremely big budget fanfic. Oh, yeah. I hate it with, so much when with I... With, like, Nomura's OCs. When I read it... I don't it, necessarily mean that in a bad way, but it is it is what it is, um, right? I, like this, should, I, I feel like this episode especially, it should not go unmentioned that Kingdom Hearts 3 features characters not from Final Fantasy XV, a game Tetsuya Nomura did not work on, ultimately... But his rejected the characters he came up with who were rejected from the actual Final Fantasy fifteen. That's great. Like this is essentially a person primarily working with and like obsessing over his own the legacy of himself. I just I I I can't believe it that they squandered such a cool, <laughs> weird premise on like going not into the Disney stuff, but going straight up into like crazy anime bullshit, <laughs> and like it's the, it doesn't make a lick of sense after some time with like some norting and whatever the hell I'm hearing yeah. online. I'm like, like uh, that is, these... uh... oh man, it makes me so sad. Yes, Wolfman, please continue. I'm just going to wallow. Norting is a um as a fan made term amongst the Kingdom Hearts community yeah. in reference to. One of the characters, Xehanort, a villain who um, brainwashes people and then turns into them, or he jumps in people's heads. Or, yeah, course, I'm actually not. Disney, so I should, we should mention Disney that Xehanort minus the X is an anagram for no heart. Oh my god. Oh, 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 it. It's like <laughs> famous Disney villain Xehanort. Like, why couldn't you, like, in, oh my god, I'm so disappointed. No, they the the games actually do have Disney villains. I know, like yeah. Maleficent and Pete. But now, let's like, just go like, and challenge. Big you know, I, I have to step up and say, you know, I personally have quite a bit of affection for the series, and it has um, a really big fan following. Oh yeah, um, which uh, which is kind of neat. You know, whereas it could have just been this flash in the pan crossover, it ended up establishing its own fan community and, oh, and its that's... own world and. I no, say this I... as a person who does not like Tetsuya Nomura, his work more generally in the Final Fantasy series, but I kind of, I have a, a weird amount of admiration for the way that he's carved out this very specific niche with Kingdom Hearts. I It would have been cool if it was, if it was its own thing and not connected to like uh, Disney that it like has uh, a lot of potential. I think it's actually kind of remarkable that's connected to disney like oh, you have yeah. this super like controlling corporation that's normally really really p- particular about what's done with its ip but because kingdom hearts was hatched in like the 10 years where disney was willing to be experimental now it's just this fucking weird thing that um that is so out of step with disney's brand image otherwise and i'm yeah. so happy that it's allowed to continue just being it's this own bug fuck weird yeah. thing. It'll be yeah, a very cool it, historical it, artifact in a hundred years. But it's like bug <laughs> fuck thing in on one end, and on the second end, it's like treating all the Disney stuff as like, oh yeah, these are just like set pieces that you just kind of <laughs> yeah. move I, through. I, 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 there is that there's a lot of effect. Like Nomura clearly loves Disney. Sure. Like there's a lot of affection for Disney properties in the game. Like, yeah. It's very clear that it's very clear that a lot of love and care is put into like taking Disney. But it like, when I say it's like fanfic, it's like, Oh yeah, I get to put my OCs in here and interact with all exactly. my favorite Disney characters. That's 100 yeah. like that. It and it is like, a, like just using Disney as a tool. If yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, it absolutely makes sense. And it's absolutely what it is. Um, just for contrast though, I do want to point out, bring this up because this is a rumor and it should only be treated as a rumor. Um, um, and nothing more, but, According to a former Kotaku writer who I do place a certain degree of trust in, uh, Nintendo did go to Disney asking to put Sora in Smash Brothers, and they completely shot them down immediately. So <laughs> I just as a contrast to show the fact that like Nomura is get has an unbelievable amount of leeway to do everything he wants with the characters of one of the most litigious companies on the planet. <laughs> Sure. Not, okay. Yeah, having, like, having said that, I, let, let me go on a uh, let me make a note here. I don't I don't care about Kingdom Hearts. I don't I'm not a, I don't hate it. I I I've, I've played like a couple of hours of the first one. I just like it's 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 quite amazing how 
how crazy it is. And I still enjoy that part of it. I'm just kind of like when when you have Disney and you have like such potential to do like cool stuff with these Disney characters and then you kind of do your own stuff. That's kind of like kind of makes me mad a little bit. I get that. Yeah, I can see that. A lot I, of people, I think, have that. Yeah. Have that but I, th- having said idea. that, I don't. I don't care actually that much about Disney characters. It's just like the squandered quality of what this could have been if it went completely the other way. Okay. So, so we're still talking about Kingdom Hearts for uh, some yeah. reason. Yeah. <laughs> I want to um, say one last thing, and then I uh, about it. Just one quick thing, if that's sure. okay. Um, which is sure. that. This is a good example, though, of something where, like, even if it didn't have the Disney stuff, obviously the Disney stuff is the, is, honestly, it's probably the only reason we are dedicating this much amount of time to Kingdom Hearts, but, like, um, even if it, even when you discount that, it's still an insane game. Its mechanics are bizarre, its system of gameplay is bizarre, it's wildly unbalanced, it uses, like, two different, like, two different genres that matches them up really badly with a lot of platforming and a lot of JRPG stuff. Like it's a bizarre experience. And, even, and that's you don't forget about the, uh, the shoot 'em up gummy ship sequences. I, you know, nothing well, says nobody JRPG has ever like an on rail shooter sequences uh, ever. But even the way like it releases their games and how and where it releases them it is just, I mean, I think you get half the story from a mobile game. I, you know, things oh. like that are just, you know, you've got a, a pretty big license there to do those kind of things, you know, so... It, yeah, it's it, utterly singular. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Kingdom Hearts! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I know why um, we talk about it a so, lot, because it's interesting, but, you know... Let me let me mention a, a successful a crossword that I think is successful. Yes, please. Um, I think I think most of us have played uh, Mario plus Rabbit's Kingdom Battle. Yeah. I have it on Switch, and I have not played it, but, yeah. Yeah, that was one that I think is is weirdly successful because it takes it kind of takes the aesthetics of Mario and the aesthetics of Rabbids, and then it's just like let's transport these things into a completely different genre mm-hmm. of game and see what happens. Yeah. Um, and they managed to make a really good tactics game out of Mario characters and Rabbid characters that takes those aesthetics and mashes up in a way that makes sense. So like it has the tone of these things. But it's a completely different, like, gameplay experience. Do you remember when it was announced yeah. at the, uh, what was it, E3 or, like, yep. GTC yeah. or something? Yeah. And, yeah. like, E3 2017. The, the, they, the, uh, the guy was, I don't remember the Ubisoft guy who was put yeah. in charge of it, but he was literally WD crying. Yeah. 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 That he was, yeah. at, at cynical me, I was like, oh, come on. You know what I mean? Like, and then I was like, wow, this actually, is, when I played it, I was like, this is a labor of love. Like, this is yep. what it feels like when you love a series and you want to work with it, but you also want to do your own thing with it. Uh, that game was shockingly good. I mean, I don't, I don't think many oh, yeah. people would have said that that had the hallmarks of a, of a, I I'd play more of it right now if it came out. Um, and yeah. I even, my wife had never touched a tactics game before and it sucked her in. I, I was telling her, I think she probably, I don't know what the equivalent of is on switch, but she hundred percent of it. I mean, there was nothing left that she had to do in that game. Yeah, um, same. And I, I was really surprised that it, it, it pulled her in, you know, cause tactics is a genre that like either you have experience with usually, or you don't, but you have to be able to talk in that game's language and, and tactics sometimes doesn't always come out for everybody, but um, man, what a, what a shock. Cause I was ready to say, this is never going to work. It won't work. And then so, blew me away. Yeah. Fantastic entry point for tactics games also. Oh. Like it's very oh. like easy going. Yeah, they sanded off all the rough edges of the genre, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's incredibly intuitive. Um on the easier uh, side from what I've heard, but you know, it's uh it's a, a Mario it Plus. Gets, it gets pretty hard it by gets the trickier end. trickier than you think. Yeah. It's a I, lot Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Sorry, very ahead. difficult by the end. I'm pretty sure that I beat the Bowser Jr. boss fight on by accident. Okay. <laughs> it is also um, the kind of game where you can beat stuff by accident because it does kind of let so you know like in XCOM when chaotic things happen you get pissed off because you're like oh I had this perfectly set right. up when chaotic things happen in Mario plus Rabbids it's actually really funny and it fits with the aesthetic of the game like the chaotic uh, the stuff that the chaotic Rabbids bring to it um, so when like you get this ridiculous chain reaction where half your 
like your team gets set on fire. <laughs> like, eh, whatever. This is kind of funny to watch. Feels right. Because uh, yeah. I've been playing another crossover lately, uh, Gears Tactics, right? Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I think a lot of people with tactics games, and this it goes for both these games, I think they equate difficulty to what I would equate and at least an XCOM at, with bullshit. I mean, it's bullshit when I have a 93% chance to hit and I don't, you know, it's, <laughs> yes. it's not bullshit. It's, well, <laughs> it's chance. You, but you know what I mean? Like, it, oh, it, I know, I know. It feels always, that way. Yeah. Yeah. It feels that way. Yeah. Uh, but, sorry, but, but that's the, the tactics game don't have any crossover with any other like genre, uh, like uh, any other, um, um, it's not like XCOM is in gears, right? It's like, uh, you, 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 you were, you were talking about like a genre crossover. Yeah. yeah. I was unaware yeah. Of the oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where I, I think people with, with difficulty, especially when they were talking difficulty with rabbits and everything, it gets very hard by the end, but it doesn't really fall into that same trap. Like XCOM does, I think where it's, you know, your psychic controlled soldier wipes out your team because yeah. you, you, you had a 1% chance of it actually happening and it did. And, you know, unless you're, if you're playing Iron Man, that's it. That's the end of your whole gameplay. Um, to me, that's not exactly difficult. That, that, that's a little bit. I don't know what you'd call it, but it's frustrating. You, you, think, you, 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 you. I think you're the person that wouldn't like many dice games in board yeah. games. It's more like, uh, hey, this is. You have everything on the board. You have every type of information that you need. There's no chance here. There's only strategy. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I it's think like I, into the you, breach. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I think if you follow the game's rules and you do what you're supposed to, the game should, for the most part, reward you. I get elements of chance, you know, but it's when I do the perfect flank and I get the perfect line and, I, and then I miss the shot, it, it's frustrating to me. But I think you can, you can, like Merv was saying, you can make difficulty feel natural and also not punishing um, in, in tactics. Games. I, yeah, I, I think that, that does really if, well. If the game uh, didn't give you the percentage chance i i actually think you would feel less cheated by it oh maybe yeah but i still yeah, think that it I would think... take a lot out of the tactics in the tactics so the way that um the way that mario rabbits does it is by just reducing it to three levels it's either 100 percent, 50 percent or zero percent mm -hmm. yeah um so you don't say 99 percent. Just... i didn't hit long, long <laughs> this game I think the most you can get away with is like you could probably put a 25 and a 75 in there and people wouldn't feel so cheated. Uh, but when you put the whole gamut in there, people interpret anything over 85 as like 100. Yeah, but I I feel like in original XCOM, there's a lot more of that when there's still like 90% or something, but there's not a full gamut of that. And I felt like that game wasn't as tactical as I liked it. Uh, yeah. In a way, like like I want my percentages to be like coming like yeah, you have like eight percent or like ten or like fifteen, not like hey, this is sixty six or uh, ninety five or something like that. And um, yeah, that's that's where I'm sitting at. But I understand that it it's frustrating. It is it is frustrating, and I wish they would solve that somehow because it feels like you. You get cheated a lot in those games, which is. Uh, I would make the case that um, that Mario and Rabbids effectively did solve it um, in in a game full of brilliant design decisions. Simplifying that 50, to just 70, three levels. No, I is don't like it. Incredible. I don't like it. I don't <laughs> like it. I like the. Yeah, not for level. everybody. Yeah, not for everybody. I I I was skeptical, but I grew to like it okay. over the course of the game. No, maybe I haven't. I say. haven't played it that much. No, I, I just, I don't like it in concept. But uh, maybe if I played the game, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, fine. But I I just I just like the numbers. <laughs> I, yeah, I like see this as a numbers. person who who adores uh, you know Fire Emblem and XCOM and mm -hmm. and XCOM Two. You know, I, I I do really adore the kind of crunchier side of tactical yeah. games. But yeah, uh, something know. about Mario and Rabbids simplified system can really like win you over in practice. Okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'm not I'm not saying that I will not like it when I play it. I just like don't like it in concept. And yeah, I would I would like the. Ta mo I wouldn't want more more tactics games with that. Uh, I, I think that there's a place for that, but you know, I I I do think that uh, maybe it's not it's, the perfect solution for everything. It's a very different feel from XCOM, though, in the sense that uh, when everything's on a grid and everything has these discrete probabilities, you tend to think you tend to plan more steps ahead. Okay, and you tend to be able to kind of strategize. 
uh, four or five more stages ahead than you would if it's you had a little kind bit, of a more continuous strategy. So space. it's a little bit more predictable in that way that you're like kind of can know more or less what will happen in the turns. Ahead. It's not that you necessarily have more certainty about what happens. It's just easier to conceptualize future possibilities okay. when you're right, restricted like, to this kind of discrete strategy space. Like, you All know right. those times in Ghost Recon where, like, your entire, you know, match hinges on making that one sniper shot that you should hit 99.9% of the time, right? Ghost Recon? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm sorry, not Ghost Recon. Um, XCOM. You have um, that Ghost Recon on your brain. <laughs> but, you know, like, so you've got it all lined up. You've got it, and, like, the whole thing comes down to this, and you miss. Um, uh, you I, see? You shouldn't have everything lined up on that one shot. You have, well, you have to have, like, backups. And I think that that Rabbids lets you plan for that eventuality a little bit more mm-hmm. than XCOM does. Uh, you know, I, I think that's what Murph's trying to say is that okay. that Rabbids will let you, it has less of a punishment for, for failing sure. in a tactical check than it does sure. some of the other games. Okay. No, no. I'm, yeah, I'm, it's a little, a little bit of that. I'll probably like, like it. I'm, I'm not criticizing it's, the game. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part, partly what I'm saying. Um, yeah, it's it's just more like when when you res- when you kind of restrict the set of possibilities, in in a way that uh, doesn't really cut down on the effective number of possibilities, then it's easier to kind of conceptualize and strategize ahead. I also think that with with the full gamut of the percentage, you have to be a, play a little bit more defensive. That, that you have to always take into consideration that you might miss. Well, that's the thing, though, is Mario plus Rabbids is kind of distinct. In that it's very aggressive. Um, the the whole nature of the game, and I don't just mean like a lot of the mechanical cutdowns, but also the stylistic elements, actually mean that you can. Uh, they they actually allow you to have um, to be, they sort of encourage you re- to move much more aggressively and to think more on your feet. Um, basically, one of the main things is that the way the fastest way to get around in the game is to use this move called team jump, where basically one of your characters can kind of like ju- can like sort of give your like other partner a boosty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. So yeah. you can end up def- and so what you end up doing is you have kind of the characters bounce off each other to move ahead, and that ends up meaning that you can just like rocket through the entire area, the each like map very very easily. Um, and when you take into account a character like Luigi who can actually jump on two players, it means that you end up with one character who's always like almost immediately goes to the vanguard and immediately gets in the action. So while you want to try to think you know carefully there's still a sense that a, you can recover from your mistakes really well in a way you kind of can't in fire emblem or especially in XCOM and B in a way that makes that extra movement feel very exciting. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's some, an element that I think gears tactics has taken where they, they kind of, um, I shouldn't say force you, but encourage you to play more aggressively. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas XCOM is very like defensive and methodical. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're very different in, in feel. Yeah. 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 I, Place for everyone. Place for every yeah. type of game. So we've talked about a bunch of crossovers that work to varying degrees. Oh, when do you think a crossover doesn't succeed? What what makes a crossover kind of fall flat in its face? Um, I, uh, um, I um. So one of the things that I was um, one of the things I wanted to talk about for like a a way that a good crossover might work. Um, yeah. was the idea of kind of combining things in different interesting ways. And I think um, when they don't, one of the ways it becomes a really big problem is when they don't, uh, is when kind of the, they don't really cross or when they don't really feel as though they're essential at all, whether in concert or alone. Um, like for instance, um, in the uh, like Nintendo, one of the later Nintendo directs, there was an announcement of a game, I believe it's called like, um, bounty battlers or something it's a fighting game and it's enough it's an indie it's an indie game f- crossover fighting game which is like the third one we've had we have a lot of these now yeah. um and yeah. while some of them have is their there own shovel twists, a lot of them just is there shovel knight in this one shovel knight's bl- like every game. yeah <laughs> yeah shovel knight um, is in fucking ukulele yeah yeah like if it's you have like there was a time where these were kind of more interesting, like Runbow, where there really wasn't stuff like that being done. Um, 
But now you have, like, Brawl Out, which is just, what if Smash Brothers Brawl had really ugly OCs? Or, um... Or, um, Brawl Hollow. PlayStation which is... All-Stars Battle Royale. Oh, yeah. God. Which is, and honestly, and sadly, PlayStation All-Stars at least did try to be, you know, it did try to actually bring in new stuff. Like, I actually like the idea of a, um, of a fighting game where, crossover, where the stages are actually fused two different properties together. It's just that it kind of was restrained by a really, really awful development time window and kind of interacting with a lot of different properties that may have not been at their best point at the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was uh, like super meat boy was one of the first like indie game crossover type things. In what think, way? It, 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 you it, mean, like the bonus stuff? Yeah, a bunch of bonus stages with characters that you could unlock that you could later play uh, as. Like in, I want to, I want to be the guy and fly wrench and, yeah, a commander video. It had a bunch of indie characters in there. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty cool. That was one well, of the first guy games that I played that had like that. Um. Yeah. Yeah. It was sorry. It was a. I went on a tangent. Sorry. Uh, please continue. Oh That's no, no, fine. it's fine. It, it, um, I actually think I'm. I didn't. I wasn't really super familiar with that, to be honest. I'm not. Meat Boy is kind of a blind spot. So uh, mm -hmm. thanks for mentioning it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. One crossover I wanted to mention that that kind of fell flat on its face was a game that came out earlier this year. Um, it's not like an official crossover. It's more like a, yeah. a conceptual spiritual. crossover between yeah. spiritual crossover. You'd say, yeah. Uh, it's kind of a crossover between, like, let's say, Ace Attorney um, and and Picross. Ooh. Picross, or you want to say it? Yeah, uh, it's oh, called Murder, Murder by, by Numbers. Yep. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So in concept, it's, interesting. In concept, oh, it's interesting, right? You um, to uncover evidence, you have to solve Picross puzzles, um, and then you present the evidence in the visual novel segments and the mystery kind of solves itself. Um, the problem is that Picross eventually gets difficult. Oh, yeah. And can take like half an hour or an hour five minutes to complete a puzzle. Yeah. And at that point, you kind of forget what's going on in the plot, especially when you are uncovering evidence. Like the, the time you go between uncovering evidence is like 30 seconds from solving a puzzle to uncovering the next piece. So you'll go through the string of like solving Picross puzzles for three hours. And then you're like, Oh wait, what was happening in the plot? Oh boy. Yeah. Right, it's, so it doesn't, um, yeah. it doesn't work at a certain point. It's like when the elements that you're trying to cross over start conflicting with each other, like the plot gets in the way, the plot feels like it's getting in the way of you doing Picross and Picross is getting in the way of you understanding the plot, that's when crossovers kind of fail. Right. Yeah. The um, It also just has a lot of other issues. The mysteries aren't that interesting, and the writing is, isn't is great. Um, the There's bonus puzzles that you can get, and you get more of them based on how many, um, how many of the optional Picross pieces you found, and it found incorrectly solved in each area, er in each, uh, mystery but the problem is that like you can't go back after a certain point so oh, no. you basically kind of get screwed out of getting all of the extra bonus pieces when if you're oh, no. and if that's kind of the reason you're playing the game which wasn't really the only reason i was playing it but i still like those it just it made a bad taste in my mouth it's uh, kind of wild that yeah, that was a problem that had already other. been resolved in the latent games by having a little puzzle house that um yeah. you know carries forward puzzles you missed Mm -hmm. Yeah, the problem here is that also if you're trying to get through it quickly, there's no signpost to what is an optional and what's a mandatory puzzle. Correct. So, yeah. like, if you want, if you didn't care about unlocking the additional puzzles, you'd be stuck doing puzzles not knowing whether or not they're optional. So it doesn't really satisfy anyone. Either you can't get all the optional puzzles that you want, or you're stuck doing optional puzzles not knowing whether they're optional. So it, it really just doesn't work on either end. Sounds like some bad design choices. There are a lot of bad design choices in that game. Yeah, yeah I think it was oh, a, kind of a, an early effort by the people who worked on it. So they'll probably get better. Cool. 
Yeah. I yeah. Think. I don't want to like, it's, it's clearly, it's one of those indie games that like clearly had a lot of love poured into it. So I don't want to dump on it too hard, but there are some clear design flaws in the way it's mixing together. It's desperate. Moments. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's not yeah. dump on, on, on that game. Let's dump more on, on Kingdom Hearts. How about <laughs> Um, I, well, uh, <laughs> the um there was actually one um like positive example of, of a crossover that I thought might be worth mentioning just because um it kind of gives rise to a lot of the problems and stuff like murder by numbers or in Tokyo Mirage sessions. Yeah. Um and that's the um that the Leighton Phoenix Wright crossover game because oh, yeah. Because on one hand, it is sort of an obvious slam dunk, but on the other hand, it's kind of a not obvious one at all yeah. because you both could, of them like, are puzzling. You could really mystery. screw it up. You could really screw it up. Yeah, because the thing it, that it is is that, like, they're both Nintendo DS, like, puzzler games that have these sort of different kinds of dramas and mysteries, and that's cool, except the problem is that, like, the logic of the latent games and Ace Attorney games don't aren't on the same level, and the drama of the latent games and the Ace Attorney level games aren't of the same level because in Ace Attorney, or um, basically in contrast to what I had said earlier about the weird, bizarre storytelling of the latent games, the Ace Attorney ones are fairly calm, like because well, they don't need ex- to except for the fact that they still adamantly say that that they take place in America when it's clearly Japan. I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the um, localized versions taking place in LA. It feel, especially it's given crazy. how much the series itself. Well, I'm okay. Especially given how indebted the series itself is to Perry Mason and Columbo. I um, guess, but, but like, also the, it, it also kind of served as like, Oh yeah. Japan has a screwed up legal system and it's very hard to be a defendant that was the premise of the game yeah Yeah, it's interesting that the localization actually undermines part of the key premise yeah which is weird i always thought it was weird but i i I kind of appreciate it but i also am sad a little bit that they they did undermine a little bit of that Yeah, it doesn't break it it's just a little odd yeah 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 it's i feel also like it's it still i think it still works since like it does create this sort of weird institutional paranoia, which um, I find very compelling. But uh, it um, so been, so in the um, Ace Attorney games, like the logic is that, you know, it's an incredibly abusive system, legal system part inspired by the modern day Japanese legal system, or at least the one of more of like 10 years ago, um, it, which is it's since changed a little bit. Um it, but it also is a world where Phoenix's assistant is a spirit medium who can talk to the dead. Yeah. It's a world where Phoenix has cross-examined animals. He's put mm-hmm. animals on the witness stand. Yep. Um, he's put dead people on the witness stand. Yeah. Um, There's a man like, with a Jordy mask, Jordy visor as a prosecutor. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Who claims to have come back from hell and become yep. a prosecutor solely to destroy Phoenix's reputation. Yep. Um, like they're like they're weird worlds and they're weird characters too because he, because Leighton is basically always on top of things. He is you know always brilliant and smart and kindly. And Phoenix isn't like a jerk. He's still nice, but he's like he's basically but, a schlamazel. The entire world seems kind of just out to get him. Yeah, he's, and so he's, when it comes yeah. to competence, he's the direct opposite of Professor Leighton. Yeah, I mean, not like every like single... he's not competent, but he's like doesn't feel competent kind of looks at all. Into the right answers. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, uh, not it's a all like of that, but... Rampa, in that sense. Yeah, yeah but he, he has to try yeah, really, it's... really hard to like get to the end game, uh, end point when when where Layton uh, yeah. very frequently just knows his shit from the get go. Yeah, they um like every single victory, even the most like tiny pathetic ones, just to keep a trial going for ten more minutes is like <laughs> this like painful <laughs> hard one. That's thing. the best part. Um, That's the best part of the game, I think. And the but the other thing is that they're both diff- their drama is different because the drama in the latent games is all this like communal thing. It's about like people and families and towns kind of like struggling through trauma. And in late and in Ace Attorney, it's partially institutional in the sense that it's an institution that is abusive and destructive. And it's also one where 
because you can the the rules of the series mean that Leighton can only has to has to prove the real murderer is in the middle of court, like a Perry Mason episode. So basically, everyone who is the real killer is they can be like kind, but they at least have to be evil enough to frame another person for murder. Yeah. Um, which, it, and so the thing with the Leighton the the Leighton and Phoenix Wright crossover is it actually turns these forms of logic and tragedy at each other. Like that becomes the crossover is essentially like figuring out how the different rules of each series interact with each other and the way that the drama interacts with each other, especially since because there's it's set in a mysterious ostensibly fantasy kingdom where witches are real and magic are, is real. And all people guilty, all women found guilty of witchcraft are immediately burned alive. It means that every time that they go on the stand and save someone from having committed, like, prove that someone's innocent, like they, the person who they prove is the killer gets immediately executed. Yeah. Um, uh, it's I, it's yeah. and it's as crazy at the end as you would imagine from a Leighton game. One I thing, would say. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm please. very curious to see that. I've been uh, like like Wolfman. I've been playing some of the Leighton games recently because they uh, they too are ideal, you know, cozy quarantine fare. Yeah. And I have my eyes yeah. set on um, on that crossover specifically because I love both of the series, and he's he's it's... talked so much sugar about it. Oh, this it's so good. It's yeah. it's one of the best 3ds games I've played. I think. Yeah. So. It's interesting. It's interesting that we've got these these kinds of um, uh, these kinds of crossovers that that kind of take um, take the fact that there there are these contrasting elements and kind of steer into the skid and let them be um, and and like make a game out of the fact that these things conflict with each other. That to me is really interesting. I think about um, uh, oh sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Warriors Orochi. I think that kind of does something similar, like yeah. you're saying, where um, you take basically to to most people, I think to most maybe Western people, that you know these characters have these similar ideals and this and that, and then, you know this is a ninja and this is a whatever. But um, I think when you start to kind of co- like combine them in a in a you know a war against evil type setting, um, that's a really fun mashup. Uh, I think that that I enjoy a lot is to see the, how those different characters interact. How does uh, Sao Sao, you know, interact with, um, you know, any of the Nobunaga? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, yeah like they, they, they're both similar in their intentions, but then when you put them together in the same game, it's like, wow, this guy's kind of more of a villain in a different way, and or or things like that. I think that's an interesting way to do kind of like what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I, I, one thing I want to ask you folks is, are there any crossovers that you have, like, uh, hypothetical crossovers that you have, like, in the back of your head that you'd like to see be made into actual video games if you had the money and power to make it happen? I have one right up front for you here. I don't want to right. steal the, uh, the spotlight up front or, you know, get out too far ahead of this, but I have got one that just came to me sure. moments ago. Metal Gear Solid crossed over with Mega Man and call it Mega Man Solid. <laughs> okay. That's, yeah. That's where uh, the you know, how did that work? There's history yeah, with, well, like, I'm... Metal Gear Solid being, like, a card game also. Yeah, and, yeah, so, yeah. You know, you could you could. Yes, acid. So, what would the gameplay of this thing be like? Would it be, like, a... a... 3D platform. Yeah, I'll, I'll pitch. I'll that? pitch two different versions of this to you, real quick. Which uh, you know, okay. uh, so one it's of them... like, a, so it's like, a, <laughs> so it's like a Tekken cross Street Fighter, a Street Fighter cross Tekken kind of thing. Yeah, there you go. Two, so, two different so games. One of these, you know, let's say you wanted to go kind of the um, the more Metal Gear Solid gameplay route. Yeah. Is um, you know, you play as Solid Snake infiltrating, you know, a classic Mega Man robot master's base and defeating the the robot master and his minions with stealth rather than Mega Man's uh, you know, shoot 'em up style. Yeah. Um the other could be uh, you know, Mega Man engaging in these, you know, stealth sections against uh classic bizarre Metal Gear Solid baddies. Yeah, both work very well. Yeah, it, it it's the crossover that, that will never happen, but should have happened yesterday. <laughs> All right, you ready for mine? Yeah. Let's hear it. Total War Westeros. 
I think that would be a game that would just consume the rest of my life if I could play that. Um, just Game of Thrones mixed with Total War. I know technically Game of Thrones is a, a TV property, but there's been enough failed games, and there actually was a failed RTS. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, yeah, I heard about that one. I think the Total War series is so perfect, where you've got you know not just the the fighting units, but you've got the the spies, the you know the little intrigue t- style units, the different ways to gather intel on your enemy, um, things like that. I think it would be so cool to play a game that really just went wild with um, with, with that type of setting and that type of gameplay. Because uh, Total War, it, I think they've they branched out in a, into fiction a, a, a few times pretty successfully yeah. lately. Um, and I, I think that if you were able... Yeah, to, like with Warhammer. Yeah, yep. I think if you were able to put those two licenses together, I think you'd hit pretty much just like the perfect blend of, of both things. And yeah, I know Game of Thrones didn't end well TV wise, um, but <laughs> I, I, I'm not ready to write it off as a as a video game setting yet. I, I love Lord of the Rings; it's had its time, and um, you know I think we've even, we haven't seen a, even a Lord of the Rings game in a while. But getting back to a good grounded fantasy, everything doesn't have to be super grim, dark Warhammer. Um, you know, there, there's some there's some potential there. I think for for bringing that that back into the a series. Well, on, on a personal level, it would be nice seeing a Game of Thrones game that was lighter and less edgy than the preceding oh, stuff in that man. installment. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I have to say, there's already a precedent for this with the Crusader Kings 2 oh, mod. Yeah. That, what, for, I was, uh, game I of was Thrones. about to say that. Yeah. 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 yeah mods, I think, are, are potential. I, I think Crusader Kings is another good fit, but you're kind of playing the you know, the, the long game with the Crusaders Kings, I think with yeah. total war, you can like, you know, grow and, you know, imagine a, a big wars at the, at the wall, you know, as, as you're, you know, getting pushed from the South by Dorne and the iron islands have a real yeah, small chance to, to come, but they're still there. And it's, you get that like kind of risk mentality going on, you know, the board game risk where it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, mistakes that you can make that can lead to your own downfall. But, uh, that's what game of Thrones is kind of all about. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right on with that. I would not have thought of Total War Game of Thrones, but I would play it. Uh, yeah, sounds like a good fit. Uh, there is like a yeah, there is like a precedent with uh, Crusader Kings, but that game is beefy when it comes to like decisions and like length of game and like complexity. So uh, it definitely would. I think it's even profitable. It would be profitable to be like, hey, Game of Thrones, like a, like that board game, Game of Thrones, actually is quite good. That is actually kind of... It's, it's such a weird license in the first place, though. I think yeah. it's stuck with that. I don't even remember the name of the company, but they put out that middling uh, RPG, and then they yeah. kind of just... That RTS had, had no basis in, in anything Game of Thrones. It was like a it's like a browser game, almost, that they yeah. slapped a Game of Thrones uh, logo on. It, it is kind of weird that by this point, the most perhaps accurate Game of Thrones game is Reigns. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, when you think about the two like was, genre defining things that we've had in our in our recent you know history, it's been Avengers and Game of Thrones, and neither one has really gotten a good video game out of it, which is just bonkers when you think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean the Avengers game is I guess on the way this year, Ugh. but who knows whether or not that will <laughs> oh, actually work? Oh boy! Yeah, I have a bad look, feeling it, about that one. If it comes out and it's good, great. If yeah. it's not, then we. I just can... I just have feeling in my bones <laughs> you and everybody else <laughs> like, yeah it's one of those things where all the all the people who have been hands-on with it say it's pretty fun but it just doesn't demo yeah, well when it just, like showing the it footage it kind of looks clunky that's it but maybe it plays great yeah. but it yeah, just kind of looks kind of clunky yeah. to be fair a lot of great games don't would it would be hard for them to look nice when you play oh, yeah. them oh but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that I so, that I get. So, um, what else is on the docket? Because I don't have any kind of crossover that I would like to see. I have uh, like very old. Oh, this guy. So, Wolfman, I, it sounds like you um, have I, a crossover you want. I have two very short ideas. Oh, cool. But, sure. Let's hear them. Um, first off is the cheap answer, and it's going to be one that I had mentioned a little before, and Cap mentioned a little bit earlier. 
There are a lot of properties in this world that could have a good action game and just haven't for whatever reason, and maybe they deserve a Musou game, like a, 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 a Dynasty Warriors, Samurai yes. Warriors, War, Warriors Orochi game. Like, look, it would not make up for the fact that we've never had a bad, or we've never had a good Avatar The Last Airbender game, but in Avatar Warriors, we're, we're slowly, Korra, like, we're slowly getting it in dreams. Yeah, we're, yeah, where Aang or Korra can just run across battlefields and cheap power fantasies. No, but, but have you seen that Dreams game? They, they, I they, have. They... I... Yeah, yeah. It's really nice. Um, yeah, why don't I own Dreams yet? Yeah, y'all gotta link me to it so I can share uh, it with everyone. I will everyone. do that after the I'm talking. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, the, um, so basically, on one hand, I kind of want something kind of nice as a way to just let in properties that maybe haven't had a chance in a while or just could, you know, use a little bit of milking like Persona. The other is, I'm going to now go even deeper and suggest a crossover within a crossover. Oh, God. Um, so we're now at a point where, like, there's no way that the next... Kingdom Super Hearts there's... beats Token Raw Sessions. <laughs> yeah. Oh, not, not quite that close. But we're now at a point where, like, there's no way that the next... Super Smash Brothers game won't inherently feel like a disappointment. They've the people who create the game have been very open that if that we're probably not going to see a game with even more than a third of the size of yeah. this roster. It's an absurdly yeah. large one and while we'll need to trim and that sucks and no one want and no character deserves to be cut flippantly, we're going to get a lot of cuts. So what I'm going to suggest is that before we do that, we ease into it a little bit with a Super Smash Brothers Imagine spinoff. And I'm going to suggest that this Super Smash Brothers spinoff will actually be half of a tactical RPG and half of a mystery adventure game in which the action, you alternate between ba large battles of dozens of your favorite Nintendo characters and then you interrogate them to see which one's the real murderer. Well, you've There's, described my ideal game there, There was an game RPG there, Wolf, like this that came out on PS3, but it wasn't a crossover. But yeah. I, I forget the name of this, but this is the exact premise of an RPG on, on PS3, and I'll put it in the link dump. Um, I thought you were going to say Smash Brothers versus uh, PlayStation Battle Royale, to be honest. <laughs> Can you imagine uh, that what one? Am I, what, what am I, Kappa? A savage? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that would be really cool. I, I think that Nintendo has kind of the most to play with in terms of what their characters can and it do uh, in, in fun ways. I think they, they've really kind of leaned into a lot of the fun uh, in, a, in, in smart ways. So I'd be interested to see them kind of do something like that. It's kind of telling. By the way, of... sorry, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, it's probably telling. All I'll say is, by the way, the RPG that I was thinking of is called Lost Dimension. Okay. Excellent. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, yep. Thanks. Uh, um, what I was going to say is that it's kind of noticeable that for the last few years, Nintendo's done a lot of crossovers, but they've all been like really weird, like Fire Emblem and uh, Persona, or but not in a way that satisfied either franchise. Uh, Zelda and Hyrule and Dynasty Warriors. Um, Zelda and Crypt Zelda of the Necrodancer. Zelda and uh, Crypt of the Necrodancer, yeah. Po Pokemon and Tekken. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What the fuck is Pokemon? Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to be me. I just think this is, this is kind of true. But I, I think you can, I think broadly, Nintendo fans in a lot of ways are easier to please. I think they'll look past a lot of the, the sure. imperfections that maybe like hardcore shooter fans or whatever won't uh, if they find a game that's kind of charming. It's got its ideas, right? And maybe doesn't have the tightest gameplay. But I mean, there's, you know, there, there's something to it, like, like a heart, I almost want to say, you know? So yeah, I, there's Mario in it, so I <laughs> like it. I, I think I think it's it's a little it's a little deeper than I'm that. Just, so you can't just slap no, no, Mario on, on something. I, I think I think that that is why Nin, I think Nintendo maybe has a license a little bit more to to experiment um, with, with crossovers because I don't think they have to worry about a fan backlash in a way that I think maybe some other uh, studios would have to worry about. I mean you can put Sonic and Mario together and, and it works where I think, you know, sometimes with the way the consoles were when I don't know if you could put Kratos and master chief in the same game and get people pumped about it without getting them angry about it. So um, Nintendo fans, I think are in a good spot to get a lot of cool things that other, other maybe, you know, yeah, developers aren't willing to play with. That's actually a really good point because like 
Master Chief, like in broader Halo fandom, is not something that people take super seriously. But I still can't imagine people wanting to mash up Master Chief into another franchise. It just wouldn't right. be something that's well received, even though people themselves don't take Halo lore all that seriously. I don't know. I've I've seen some people on the internet that. Oh, that yeah, dude. like I'm not saying they're not invested in Halo lore. It's like. If somebody sees a Master Chief meme, they're not angry. At oh, them. yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, like, people embrace things like red versus blue. Yeah, and, and I, I, like, even past just, like, the, the idea, like, Nintendo's Nintendo's comfortable, I think, letting people take chances with their franchise now. I don't think they had been historically, but uh, when you get good results from it, I think you can go further down that path. Yeah. Um, so they've had some good luck. So I think if you're looking for, like, like something like uh, Wolfman was saying, I think there's a real strong possibility of Nintendo like listening to those types of ideas and, and running with them even because they're they're interested in in getting more people exposed to Nintendo characters in, in any way possible. I feel like. So you're saying we should put Halo in Super Smash Bros. Oh man, I'd, I'd, the actual I'd ring. Actually buy the it. actual <laughs> ring. Um, I should. Oh no. Um, that would be just I'm the entire say... planet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um. So speaking of a Nintendo ish crossover that i think would work um imagine like zoo tycoon or jurassic world evolution but with the fantasy monsters from xenoblade yes please yep i have um, like not not just like the regular monsters but the monsters with the really dumb names like machine gun julio the best monsters (laughs) you mean yeah like just throw them all in in a magical menagerie because the creatures are so the creatures in Xenoblade are so interesting and cool and, and well designed. I just want to raise them and like feed them yeah. and keep yeah. them away from visitors and make sure yeah. they don't kill the visitors. It, it, this is, of course, the part where I'm straining to not just completely destroy the podcast by just referencing every single ridiculously dumb name. <laughs> we had a segment on that. We <laughs> did, yeah. I believe. I think I may have you been read all the names out. Yeah. Um, I would go um, in for a very similar concept, but with Dragon Quest monsters. Wouldn't that be delightful? With like the little yeah. slime, rain, blue raindrop slime, yeah. dude. Yeah, just call it Slime Rancher or something. Oh, that's an interesting concept. Yeah, I would buy I've that. never heard of that <laughs> game. <laughs> Wasn't that already a game? That, <laughs> yes. that, that was yeah. the joke. Oh, so. hence, the, <laughs> hence the sarcastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, my, sorry my about fault. that. <laughs> that's all right. Um, well, this was a fun discussion of crossovers and mashups and the like. Uh, we mashed up five different people's opinions into a somewhat coherent podcast. Oh, God. So, hmm? Congratulations to all of you. Uh, um, I, so I feel like I like, poisoned the well. <laughs> this well was poisoned my so long ago. For Kingdom Hearts. <laughs> it's just like... It's, oh, Kingdom Hearts is, is a poison. For oh, us. We will um, get letters. We will get letters. I, I said a while ago, I, I'm glad things exist that people can enjoy them, but there's stuff I've come to the point where I'm like, I just know it's not for me. And Kingdom yeah. Hearts is just... I mean, it's 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 cool that it exists. I wish it could be... I wish I could be part of that world because people yeah. sh- shit seem to enjoy it, but... There's a lot of kind of things about it that I just I can't get past. I just and I uh, yeah, I here. get that way with movies and music and, and lots of other things. So I don't I think you're like me. It's not bad it's out there. It's just one of those yeah. things where it's really hard I, to push through I, and enjoy. As they say, I do not want to yuck anyone's yum. If if, <laughs> if someone yeah, if someone really likes it, yeah, go go nuts. I don't I don't want to like you know, be an old curmudgeon and say, "Man, it's shit." No, it's it. You know, if you like it, you like it. It's not for me. All right. If you would like to yuck our yum, mm. you could follow us on our website at avocadogamescast.wordpress.com, where we post each episode along with a link dump to provide you resources for the kinds of things we discussed on the episode. Um, you can also subs- you can ah, I can say words. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play Music. Just search for Avocado Gamescast and make sure you check out both The Avocado, which is the community that spawned this podcast, at the-avocado.org. And also check out uh, the Franchise Festival podcast, I believe, at franchisefestivalpodcast.com. You've got it. Yeah, you're too kind. All right. Yeah. So Breakman does a somewhat regular roundup of uh, franchises, of 
throughout video game history. Uh, and he's been writing up articles about that and also doing a companion podcast to dive a little bit more in depth on some of these franchises. Yeah. Uh, so to uh, check that out because it's a lot of fun. Um, to, to put in a quick plug for that, uh, season one, we're covering The Legend of Zelda in depth, entry by entry, with new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. Nice. Oh, wow. You actually stick to a schedule. Whoa. That's more than we've ever done over <laughs> ah. it's, it's the only way that I can I can try to build this listener base. I tell you, it's 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 tough out there for a humble podcaster, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Tell me about um, it. But don't worry. Uh, the Trump Club and Stamps.com sponsorships. Are <laughs> Shave.com. They're beating down what my is? door. Sh- Shave Club? <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Dollar Shave yeah, Club? Yeah, whatever. More like dollar put the dollars in my pocket shape <laughs> wow, burn i yeah. think <laughs> i have no idea what i'm saying oh, um, all right talking. thank you all for being on the podcast thank you to our listeners for listening and we will see you next time bye. Bye. take care everyone bye bye, bye. bye, 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 bye. have a good night Stay here.